Yes, yeah, so, oh, I have to click that I consent to the recording. Excellent, yeah, so thank you very much again uh, for the introduction, uh, Hyun Min. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second day of this uh, three-day lecture series. Yesterday, we talked about a couple of uh, basics of gra gravitational wave physics. In the first lecture, we covered some of the theoretical basis and the proper definition of gravitational waves in flat Minkowski space uh, in the presence of a source term and then also in curved space time. Then we looked at the propagation or the, yeah, the definition and propagation of gravitational waves in uh, cosmological background solutions, FLRW. And in the second part of the lecture yesterday, we talked a bit about um, experiments trying to uh, detect and uh, search for gravitational waves. Uh, we talked a bit about uh, experimental sensitivities and pulsar timing and CMB probes of gravitational waves. And this has now set the stage to eventually turn to actual sources of gravitational waves, processes, physical processes that lead to the detection, uh, to the production of gravitational waves that we can uh, go and look for in our experiments. Uh, and as the title of this lecture series is Gravitational Waves from the Early Universe, we will be particularly interested uh, in gravitational waves that have been produced at very, very early times uh, in, in our universe. And so that's why today I want to kick things off uh, with the first lecture on gravitational waves uh, in the context of Big Bang and inflationary cosmology. So, yep, uh, just a, a brief overview of the history of our universe from the perspective of uh, hot Big Bang cosmology. Uh, we know and we observe that the universe is expanding, so we can basically uh, extrapolate uh, this evolution back in time. We can basically rewind the movie and, and then uh, uh, describe how the universe must have looked like in, in the past. So uh, because our universe is expanding, we know that in the past, at earlier times, it must have been denser, hotter, and processes, particle physics processes at high energies must have taken place. In our universe, we have clear observational evidence uh, for this picture provided by the CMB, the, the coupling of photons, roughly 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And uh, we can also measure the primordial abundances of light elements that have been created right after the Big Bang uh, in the process that's called uh, primordial nucleosynthesis or Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Um, which you can also see here in this little cartoon. Uh, so that roughly took place um, starting around uh, yeah, one second after the Big Bang and then lasting for um, up to uh, yeah, two, three minutes. Uh, however, um, this is basically where the observational evidence uh, stops uh, and, and uh, everything beyond that and everything that happened during the very first section, uh, sorry, first second after the Big Bang uh, is still unexplored territory uh, and then this is where gravitational waves promise to uh, provide us with a new tool to access these very early times and then probe the physics at these extremely um, early times and high energies and high temperatures. So gravitational waves, they provide us with a new window onto the early universe that allow us to probe even earlier times. Um, so uh, here's an overview of the things I want to cover uh, in this first lecture before the break. So during the next uh, one hour and 15 minutes, roughly. So first of all, I want to talk about a few general properties of gravitational waves in the context of a hot Big Bang cosmology. Um, and then I want to take you through a, um, yeah, uh, a short calculation that illustrates how the gravitational wave signal can be calculated from a generic source in the early universe. So I will provide you with a general recipe that tells you how you can calculate the gravitational wave signal once you know the statistical properties of the source. Um, so this will be the first two sections uh, of this lecture. And then in the third part, I will turn to uh, inflation uh, and describe the irreducible background of gravitational waves produced during inflation. Uh, and then as 
I was actually intending to cover a lot of material uh, in, in this lecture. I couldn't really fit everything into what I can say in one hour and 15 minutes. So there will be also some bonus material here in the PDF slides uh, at the very end. And then if you're looking at the PDF slides and you're still interested, I invite you to also have a look at this bonus material. Okay, so let's start with the properties of gravitational waves, just in the context of standard hot Big Bang uh, cosmology. So we want to consider a gravitational wave source in the early universe operating at some high temperature T. Uh, and first of all, we're interested in how the gravitational waves produced at such a high temperature redshift uh, throughout the um, following expansion of the universe. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, how the redshift all the way up to today when we can hope to observe these gravitational waves. So yesterday we learned already that the spectral ener energy density of radi uh, spectral energy density of gravitational waves redshifts like radiation. So yesterday we defined this omega parameter, the energy density parameter of gravitational waves. Uh, we defined this as uh, the spectral energy density, so energy per logarithmic frequency interval. Uh, in relation to the critical or total energy density of the universe. And we saw that this entire object scales like one over the scale factor to the fourth power. That's exactly the same redshift behavior as in the case of uh, radiation, photons, mm -hmm. uh, for instance. Um, and then this accounts for the expansion of the volume. So this gives you a factor of one over A cubed. Uh, but then there is also an additional factor one over A, which accounts for the redshift um, on this, in the stretching of the gravitational waves themselves in the course or in consequence of the expansion. All right. Um, so uh, with this redshift behavior here, we can relate the gravitational wave spectrum that we see today to the energy density at the time of production. So this is what I want to do here in the next equation. Um, so we basically write our omega gravitational wave. Uh, okay, so we ha again have this factor one of a rho c. Uh, and now I want to use the ratio of scale factors a over the present value of the scale factor to the fourth, uh, to the fourth power to relate this to this object here at temperature t. Okay, so on the left-hand side, we evaluate the spectrum today. And then uh, by means of this ratio of scale factors, we can relate this to the fractional energy density at the time of production. And then the last step, I just multiply by rho total, the total energy density at that time, and I divide by the total energy density at that time. So, uh, well, this factor obviously cancels, but if I pull this one over rho total inside the square brackets, then it, everything inside the square brackets is basically something like this omega parameter. So the relative energy in gravitational waves at the time of production, so at temperature T. So you see this factor that I multiplied and divided by with here is uh, the total energy density, which is just given by the Hubble parameter as a function of temperature at that time. Okay, um, so now this already leads to some interesting observation about the properties of the, uh, on the shape of the gravitational wave spectrum that we can uh, expect from such a process in the early universe. Now, if we assume that the process responsible for generating gravitational waves, um, if that is sort of self-similar or scale invariant, uh, if within a certain temperature interval, the energy in gravitational waves related to the total energy density is always the same. So if we assume that the square bracket here is a constant for some temperature interval, uh, then this will lead to a flat spectrum of gravitational waves doing radiation domination. And the way to see this is the following. So if we assume that there's a scale invariant source, the square bracket here is this constant for some temperature interval. Uh, and at, during the time of radiation domination, the total energy density decays like one over the scale factor to the fourth power. So A to the fourth power times rho total will be a constant, roughly a constant during radiation domination. So such sources that are active during radiation domination will give us a flat spectrum of gravitational waves. I, I put an approximate sign here and I also have a footnote uh, because this is only true up to uh, corrections that are related to the changes in the effective numbers of degrees of freedom. So maybe this is a statement or a comment for the experts uh, in the audience, but uh, if you're familiar with these effective numbers of degrees of freedom, 
G star and G star S, um, then yeah, well, you, uh, you will know what I mean. Uh, these degrees of freedom, they count how many relativistic species contribute to the energy density of the thermal bath and to the entropy density of the thermal bath. Uh, in the standard model of particle physics, uh, these quantities change as a function of temperature, and this will lead to slight corrections uh, to this relation here. But apart from these changes in G star and G star S, uh, this statement here holds true. All right, so this is a statement about the uh, spectrum itself. And uh, you can also look at the behavior of the gravitational wave frequency. So now I want to consider, again, a process that takes place at some temperature T in the early universe, and that produces gravitational waves that correspond to some physical wave number k over a. So yesterday we've seen k already in, a, in many places. k is just the co-moving wave number. Uh, and if I divide the co-moving wave number by the scale factor at the time of production, I get the physical uh, wave number at that time, right? And I'm interested in the frequency of that process or the frequency that corresponds to uh, this physical wave number today. So I can just calculate it. We've seen this relation yesterday also um, by taking my co-moving wave number and divided by the present value of the scale factor. So then this will turn again into a physical quantity and I will have the physical wave number today and I divide by two pi to get the physical frequency today. But now it's instructive to relate this frequency and also the physical wave number at the time of production to the Hubble scale or the Hubble radius at the time of production. And for this, I just want to rewrite this little expression here. So basically what I do is I, uh, I multiply by A and I divide by A and I multiply by H and I also divide by H. So uh, this is all I do, just multiplying by A times H and dividing by A times H. And then I get from here to this expression. So now I relate the frequency that I'm interested in to the Hubble rate at the time of production. Um, and you see that since the time of production up to today, the frequency redshifts like one power of the scale factor. Okay, so this is also shown here in this little cartoon. Um, the frequency uh, decreases because the wavelength grows linearly as one power of the scale factor. And this prefactor here, x, uh, just by means of, uh, because of the manipulations that I uh, performed here, uh, this prefactor x now characterizes the relation between the physical wave number at the time of production to the Hubble rate at the time of production. Um, so if I consider a causal process that produces gravitational waves at that time, something that creates gravitational waves inside the Hubble radius, um, then this number x will be at most, uh, sorry, at least one. And if the physical wave number is larger than the Hubble rate, uh, Hubble rate, so if everything happens deeper inside the Hubble radius, then x will be larger than one, okay? So one is basically a lower bound on this uh, quantity x here. Okay, so we see that we can relate the frequencies that we ob observe today to the values of the scale factor in the early universe and the Hubble rate in the early universe as a function of temperature. And now you can write down ex an explicit expression for these quantities. So you can work with things like entropy conservation in the early universe, and you use the Friedman equation to express the Hubble rate as a function of temperature. And for time reasons, I cannot present this calculation, but I can just show the final result. So what you see here in equation four is the same as this one here, but now I just replace the scale factor and the Hubble rate by explicit expressions in terms or as functions of the temperature. And then you see that the frequency today um, that we observe today is related in this way here on the right-hand side to the temperature in the uh, universe at which the corresponding gravitational wave has been produced. Uh, just a comment on the notation. So here I write down F in relation to F naught which is defined up here. So this is just a reference frequency uh, given in terms of the present value of the Hubble parameter. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, we have the energy density parameters of uh, the vacuum. So dark energy, matter, mostly dark matter, uh, and then radiation. All right. And you see again, this little prefactor X, K here in front. If X is one, 
It just means that the gravitational wave was as large as the entire Hubble radius at the time of production. If X is larger than one, it means the gravitational wave was uh, deeper inside the Hubble radius at the time of production. Hello? Yes. I have a simple question. So does the relativistic distribution freedom uh -huh. uh, be modified if we have a gravi uh, gravitational wave? Um, well, this is sort of related, I would say, to uh, what we discussed yesterday. So gravitational waves, uh, they can, they represent a form of dark radiation. That's true, yes. Uh, but then you can constrain the amount of dark radiation by constraints on delta N effective. So uh, and in principle, you can, yeah, that's true. I mean, in principle, you can add the contribution from uh, gravitational waves to the right-hand side of the Friedman equation. And then the energy, energy uh, containing gravitational waves would also appear here uh, on, on the right-hand side. Yeah, that's correct. But I mean, as we have um, constraints and then tight bounds on delta N effective, we know that this will only be, uh, if any, a, a small correction. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, but also in any case, I mean, whenever you had, okay, so now you ask about uh, gravitational waves uh, and then they, well, in principle, you can write them down. You know, they appear on the right-hand side of the Friedman equation. But also if you add new physics, for instance, if you go from the standard model to uh, the minimal supersymmetric standard model, the MSSM, all of this will appear here uh, in these numbers of degrees of freedom. Absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think it's instructive to look at this relation here and evaluate this in certain limiting cases. So if we go to uh, very high temperatures, then the last term here will dominate. And this just means that at very early times at very high temperatures, uh, the universe is dominated by relativistic radiation. So then we can focus here on this term in the square brackets and we find a linear relation between frequency and temperature. Then at later times at slightly lower temperatures, uh, this term here will dominate. And that means that the universe transitions from radiation domination to matter domination. And we have a, um, this relation here where the frequency goes like the square root of temperature. And then at the latest times in the cosmological evolution, so basically very recently uh, in the history of our universe, this term here will dominate. So this means this is the onset of dark energy domination in our universe. Uh, and then the frequency will be inversely proportional to temperature. Uh, that may appear a bit odd, uh, but that just means that now during the very latest stages of the cosmological evolution, um, uh, the universe is, the expansion is accelerating again and gravitational wave modes uh, no longer enter into the Hubble horizon and uh, go deeper inside the Hubble horizon. But now during the final, during the latest stages of the cosmological evolution, as the universe is accelerating again, they are rather uh, leaving the Hubble horizon uh, again. So this is reflected here uh, in, in this relation. So if the temperature decreases, the frequency again begins to, uh, to grow. All right, so we can also plot this function, uh, which you can see here uh, in this little plot on the left-hand side. This really is just uh, equation 14, a graphical representation of equation 14, uh, sorry, equation four. Uh, and for most of the temperature in the early universe at all these very high temperatures, uh, the universe is simply dominated by radiation. Uh, and we have this linear relation F proportional to, um, to temperature. Uh, then at, in this regime here, around, yeah, uh, close to the time of CMB, the coupling, uh, we are in meta domination and the slope of this white line changes a bit. I mean, this is a log log plot. So it's still a straight line, but um, the slope is different. And then if you look very carefully, you can still see some, well, change in the slope here at the very end. Uh, so this marks the onset of dark energy uh, domination. But the important message from this entire exercise, from this equation here and from this plot, is that we can now identify certain frequency ranges that different experiments are sensitive to. We can identify them with different temperature ranges in the early universe. So we know, for instance, that pulsar timing arrays, observations of pulsars that we also talked about yesterday, they're sensitive to gravitational waves around the nanohertz or so, so uh, around here on the frequency axis. And now we can use our white curve or this formula to convert uh, the, the sensitivity to nanohertz gravitational wave frequencies to the sensitivity of a certain temperature interval in the early universe. And this tells us that PTA experiments 
they can pr probe processes uh, around temperatures of um, a GeV or plus minus a bit more, a bit less. LISA will be sensitive to gravitational waves in the millihertz range. And that corresponds to temperatures around the electroweak scale. And that's also very exciting because then LISA uh, can actually go and look for um, modifications of the electroweak phase transition that could actually lead to gravitational waves. And then finally, the ground-based interferometers, they're sensitive to gravitational waves in the audio band, 10 hertz, 100 hertz, up to a kilohertz. And this corresponds to very high temperatures, 10 to the 9 GeV. So if LIGO should see at some point, fingers crossed, if LIGO should see at some point um, gravitational waves from the stochastic background of gravitational waves from the very early universe, then this must have been produced at very early times at temperatures as high as maybe yeah, 10 to the 9 GeV or even up to 10 to the 10 GeV. Uh, and then LIGO would certainly probe uh, ter territory beyond the standard model of particle physics. All right. Uh, oh, uh, I think, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I uh, gave a slightly confusing answer to the question we just had. I'm sorry about this. Um, I, I said that gravitational waves can also act, act as a form of, of dark radiation. And, uh, uh, you measure this in terms of delta N effective, but this is actually something I wanted to cover now. Yeah, so we didn't talk about it yesterday. Uh, this is this is what I wanted to mention on this slide here. So sorry about this. Uh, I hope this will also clarify again your question. Um, so here we looked at the frequency temperature relation. Yeah, so some relation between the frequency today and the temperature at the time of production in the early universe. And now I want to look at the total energy density of gravitational waves in the early universe at some high temperature t. Okay, so we start with the same expression. This is the total amount of energy in gravitational waves uh, today. Uh, and I want to relate this to the gravitational wave energy density at, at temperature T. So the starting point is basically an equation uh, like this here. Uh, but instead of multiplying and dividing by the total energy density, I, I just want to multiply and divide by the energy density in radiation. So this is what I do here. So you see one energy density of radiation down here in the denominator. Uh, and now I also properly take into account the degrees of freedom, the effective numbers of degrees of freedom. So then this is the expression you find. Um, the other factor of the energy density in radiation is contained in here. So the density parameter for radiation is just rho radiation today divided by the critical energy density today, all right? Um, so this is how we relate the total energy density today in gravitational waves to the energy density at some early time at temperature T. Um, okay, so this thing here contains the effective number of degrees of freedom, G star. And then this thing here also contains the effective number of degrees of freedom today. So I can basically absorb this factor in rho radiation and this factor here in this omega density parameter. Um, or you can replace it by, by the number of degrees of freedom of photons. So if I drop this prefactor, I can have the same expression where I just put the energy density parameter of photons here and the energy density of photons at some early time down here in the denominator. Okay, so now we have a handy expression that tells us how is the energy density in, in gravitational waves related to this ratio at early times. And now I want to talk about dark radiation. I'm sorry that I, <laughs> uh, that I mixed this up. Yeah, so this is what I want to cover now here on this slide. Um, we can parameterize the amount of extra radiation, radiation beyond the standard model of particle physics uh, in terms of an effective number of degrees of free, uh, an effective number of neutrino species or some yeah, um, effective contribution to the energy density in radiation. Uh, and this is typically, typically done here in this way. Uh, here, I, this is valid for temperatures below the electron mass. So uh, electron positron annihilation in the early universe has taken place already. The neutrinos, the neutrino bath has a different temperature compared to the photon bath. This explains um, this numerical factor back here. Um, and then we have the standard model prediction for the number of neutrino species. Uh, it's roughly three. The exact value is given down here. It's not exactly three if you perform a precision calculation. 
uh, because doing electron positron annihilation, the neutrinos will also be slightly heated uh, and that will give a correction here at the percent level to this prediction of the standard model. But then anything that is present in addition at these temperatures uh, will contribute to this delta N effective. So if you have new particle species that behave as relativistic radiation at these temperatures, uh, they will uh, they can be accounted for here by this delta N effective. All right, so uh, let me extract the relevant piece from this expression here. Uh, so this is the total rho radiation, but then the new piece the one piece that is linear in delta N effective is just this one. So I collect all the prefactors, this prefactor, this prefactor, this factor of two and, and this factor, and then I get the delta rho radiation, all right? Um, and then we see this already up here. We want to have expressions in relation to the photon energy density. So let me just take this piece here and divide by the energy density and photons. So then I will get rid of this uh, temperature to the fourth power and I will get rid of uh, the pi squared over 30 and so on. So uh, now we have that relation here and this is the way in, in, in which I want to quantify the relative energy in new forms of radiation. So the relative energy in dark radiation with respect to the energy in photons. There's some numerical prefactor, this is just a matter of convention, maybe also, yeah, uh, for historical reasons. Um, so I always have to carry with me this numerical prefactor, uh, but then the physical observable that I'm interested in uh, is this delta N effective here on the right-hand side. All right, um, so now the statement is that if gravitational waves are around at these early times, at these temperatures, then obviously they can only make up at most 100% of dark radiation. So the amount of dark radiation is quantified by delta N effective, but as soon as I put some value for delta N effective, gravitational waves can account for, for at most 100% of that. So we know that gravitational waves can be at most as large as this delta uh, rho radiation, which is controlled by delta N effective. Okay, so now we can go back up to the very first line here. I'm interested in these temperatures after positron electron annihilation. At this time, this G star S no longer changes. So it's the same value at all these temperatures. I can just drop this prefactor. So my total energy density in gravitational waves is just this factor. I can drop this factor because this is a one and this ratio between energy in gravitational waves and energy in photons. All right. Um, so now I take this inequality and I can replace this ratio rho gravitational wave over rho gamma, I can replace it by this ratio here in equation eight. So I uh, copy this factor, omega photons, and I just write down um, this thing here on the right-hand side. So seven over eight, and then uh, four over 11 to the power of four thirds times delta N effective. And, and this is the result I wanted to derive. So everything now in front of delta N effective uh, is numerical and known. So we know the energy density parameter of photons in the present universe. Uh, and we can multiply by this number. And if I do this, I get this uh, result here, 5.6 times 10 to the minus six. So it's just this numerical factor, which multiplies delta N effective. So, okay, maybe if, if some of my explanation, explanations were a bit confusing, or if I have been a bit fast in between, don't worry. The result, important result is just here inside the box. The entire purpose of this exercise was to relate the total energy density in gravitational waves um, to this observable delta N effective. And then here you have it. Yeah, It's linear in delta N effective times this numerical prefactor, which I just derived. And now you can do your cosmological observations and try to uh, constrain delta N effective based on um, BBN analyses and CMB observations. And whenever you have a constraint on delta N effective, you plug it into this number here, sorry, into this equation here, you multiply by this number and you get a bound on the total amount of energy in gravitational waves. Um, and this would also then, well, give you an upper bound on how much gravitational waves can contribute here on the right-hand side uh, of this relation. So this is maybe a better answer to the question that, what, that, what, that was just asked. All right. Um, so let me provide you with a couple of numbers. Um, 
So what are the most recent constraints on Delta N effective? Uh, and yeah, for this, it's quite interesting to note that just last year, the lunar collaboration um, has performed a new measurement of an important nuclear cross-section that is relevant for primordial nuclear synthesis. So Luna has measured precisely the cross-section for this uh, process of deuterium going to helium-3. And previously, this nuclear cross-section had been the most uncertain nuclear physics input for BBN analyses. Now there are other cross-sections uh, which determine the theoretical error. And I guess the experiments are now eager to also determine these cross-sections more precisely. But at least the, the um, cross-section that mostly was driving the uncertainty uh, previously has now been determined uh, to better precision by the lunar experiment. All right, and then now you can basically rerun with this new cross-section, you can rerun your, BN, uh, your BBN analyses. You can combine it with CMB data, CMB data to obtain uh, up-to-date constraints on data and effective. Um, and now, even after this new lunar measurement, we find concordance, so agreement between BBN analyses, CMB observations, and astrophil, astrophysical determinations, observations of the deuterium abundance and helium-4. So um, the standard model of cosmology uh, still stands and uh, everything, I mean, as far as um, these analyses are concerned, looks uh, consistent. Um, and now you can yeah, run the analysis and use it and use the new data to derive constraints on uh, an effective or delta n effective, uh, maybe together with other interesting cosmological parameters. Uh, for instance, um, the energy density parameter of uh, baryons which is related to the baryon asymmetry of the universe, which is another important input parameter or yeah, uh, parameter of BBN. Uh, and then you find the following result here on the left-hand side. So this is an analysis from November last year, um, uh, which uses the lunar, lunar measurement. And this is for four different measurements of the helium for uh, abundance. Um, there's still some uncertainty in, in, in this measurement. That's why they show different results for each of these individual determinations of the helium for abundance. Uh, in, in orange, you see constraints derived from Planck data. Uh, and in blue, you see constraints from uh, the BBN analysis. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then you see that we have yeah, type constraints on, on both parameters. Um, and in, in particular, N effective cannot deviate too much from the standard model prediction, which was um, three point zero, four, and then so on. So from this plot, you can read out that typically uh, N effective can maybe vary by 0.3 or maybe up to 0.4 within these uncertainties around the standard model value. So I can take this uh, benchmark value or this reference value of 0.3. I can just plug it in here into this relation. And that gives me an upper bound on the total energy density uh, in gravitational waves. Uh, and you see it's tightly constrained, cannot uh, contribute more than a fraction of 10 to the minus six to the total energy density of the universe. However, it's important to recall that this equation here, equation 10, is uh, an upper bound on the total integrated gravitational wave energy density. So uh, we just look at the entire energy that is contained in gravitational waves. That means we have to integrate this um, spectral energy density over a certain frequency range. Uh, and we can integrate up to uh, very large frequencies, gravitational waves that are deep inside the Hubble horizon. But we have to start at some finite frequency, FBBN, which is around 10 to the minus 12 hertz, uh, because this, these, these are the gravitational waves that um, are basically as big as the Hubble radius at the time of BBN. And if you look at gravitational waves at even lower frequencies, at even larger wavelength, they don't actually fit inside the Hubble radius anymore at the time of BBN. Uh, so they do not contribute as propagating relativistic degrees of freedom um, to this total energy density that I constrain, that we can constrain uh, with measurements of delta N effective. All right, and obviously this only applies to primordial gravitational waves because they, they need to be around already at the time uh, when the processes that we're considering here um, have taken place. So these primordial gravitational waves, they must have been produced at temperatures around 
uh, 0.1 MeV or even earlier. Okay, so this is all I wanted to say about the general properties of gravitational waves in hot Big Bang uh, cosmology. We talked about the frequency temperature relation, and I explained how you can constrain the total amount of energy in gravitational waves by means of these uh, constraints on delta n effective. And now during the next 10 minutes or so, I want uh, to, so can, yes, can I is there a question a on this, please? Yeah, on the previous slides, uh, can we replace the lower bounds of this F to FCMB? I mean, the That's a very good question. Yes, I mean, if you close your eyes <laughs> and pretend that there's no delta N effective bound from BBN, then you can do it, yeah? So if I only consider CMB analyses uh, and just use the delta N effective bound from CMB, this would be the way to go. But I mean, we know that there is a bound on delta n effective from BBN. Um, and yeah, then you also have to account for it. But uh, when I see the orange, I mean, uh -huh. uh, solely from the plunk, I, I yes. think there is another bounds on an effective from the plunk. That's and, true, and yes. So we have a two, a kind of two independent bounds. Um, yes. In a in a sense that's that's correct yes um, I mean uh, yeah you you can play these games uh, and then look at one observable at the time or at one cosmological probe at the time and then derive different bounds on uh, delta n effective and each I mean this relation here in equation nine is general okay and whenever I take a cosmological probe that gives me a bound on delta n effective I put it in here, uh, and that gives me a constraint on the total amount of energy density in uh, total amount of energy in gravitational waves. Um, and well, then in this case, it applies to everything integrated over frequencies in gravitational waves that are relevant at the time uh, of the probe that I'm, that I'm considering. So I can, I can do such an analysis for the CMB, I can do it for, uh, for, the B, uh, for BBN. But I would say that, uh, yeah, I mean, if you include BBN data, this is maybe um, the most comprehensive case because I integrate over the largest frequency range and I go back uh, the furthest the furthest in, in time and temperature. Yeah, uh, so one product on quick fabrication is that, okay, if two uh, observations are consistent, does it mean that there isn't any uh, large source of the gravitational waves? during those two periods. Sorry, can you ask that again? So if, if this bound is, I think I'm, I didn't understand. Can you say it again? If there, uh, if two constraints from the CMB and BBN consistent with each yes. other, does it mean uh, there is no source of large gravitational waves during? Um, two, uh, I, I think if I sent the question correctly, then um, yeah. So, I mean, can determine about the delta and effective from BBN. Um, uh, and I think a very interesting scenario would be if there is some change in the effective number of degrees of freedom in yeah. between BBN yes. and CMB. And then you would know that some kind of new physics, some process must have taken place. Uh, if you find consistent results, it, it just means that, um, yeah, uh, nothing has happened to a dark radiation. I mean, no new forms of dark radiation have appeared in between or have disappeared between BBN and CMB. But I mean, at the moment, we're just talking about upper bounds, right? So I mean, um, yeah. uh, everything is still consistent mm -hmm. with the standard model value. It could well be mm -hmm. that there simply is no large amount of dark radiation at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, I mean, uh, later on, we'll look at typical sources of gravitational waves. Uh, and they typically, I mean, they can, they result in a spectrum at amplitudes which are much smaller than 10 to the minus six. So uh, you can still produce gravitational waves and have a spectrum of gravitational waves um, that are much, much below this upper bound from delta n effective. And then you will never be able to constrain this based on delta n effective because if, if uh, my gravitational wave spectrum has an amplitude of 10 to the minus 10, I would need to be able to measure delta n effective with an insane precision, uh, which would be very unrealistic. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, 
Can I have a question? Uh, you have yes. a stronger bound from CMB on delta and effective. And so is it possible to eliminate dark radiation? I mean, in the case of particle physics, a particle candidate, uh, it is possible to erase dark radiation before CMB, right? But uh, in this case, in the case of uh, gravitational waves, uh, is it uh, possible to eliminate dark radiation before CMB somehow? Because the BBN constraint is not that uh, strong as compared to, I mean, as I see from the plot, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's, uh, it's not that con uh, strong as compared to the CMB constraint. So. Um. <laughs> Yes, I, the, the BBN constraint is not as strong, but um, can, can, can you maybe repeat the question? The question is whether um, you can use the CMB data first to eliminate the possibility of a large amount of dark radiation? Yes. Um, yes, uh, I mean, I think this relates to the question how these bounds will improve in the future. Um, I mean, the way forward in the CMB analysis, I think is, um, at least there, there's, there, there's some, some ideas or it's clear how uh, this will proceed in the future. Um, so next generation of uh, CMB polarization experiments, such things like uh, CMB stage four, they will become much more sensitive uh, to delta and effective. And I think then these error bars here will shrink uh, significantly. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure what the way forward would be in terms of these BBN analyses. So I can imagine that in the future, yeah, uh, there will be more progress on the CMB side, but uh, maybe also one of the experts on uh, BB analysis can, can, can correct me on this. I think, as I understand correctly, um, this lunar measurement here last year has already been a major achievement. You see the paper was published uh, in Nature, um, and this has really removed uh, a big uncertainty in these BBN calculations. Uh, and I'm not sure how fast they will be able to make progress on these other nuclear cr cross sections. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, yes, uh, let, let's continue. Uh, I still have 35 minutes for this first lecture. Um, yes, I want to consider a generic source of gravitational waves in the early universe. Um, and then we've, as we've seen yesterday, um, these sources appear on the right hand side of I mean, initially of the Einstein field equation, but then they also appear on the right-hand side as source terms of our equations of motion uh, for the tensor perturbations for gravitational waves. Uh, and in some FLRW background, in a cosmological background, uh, this source term, the anisotropic stress tensor can just be written like this, where we have the energy momentum tensor, the scale factor uh, and pressure. Okay, uh, and one example for such an anisotropic stress tensor would, for instance, be uh, the one from a cosmological phase transition. We will talk about this after the break today. And this describes the couple dynamics of a scalar field that is responsible for this phase transition and the fluid, the hot plasma, um, in which the phase transition takes place. And then the anisotropic stress tensor would take this form, including one piece for the scalar field and one piece uh, describing the velocity and the dynamics in the fluid. But this is just an example, and we'll come back to this later. All right, um, so remember that the tensor perturbations that describe gravitational waves satisfy this transverse traceless uh, condition. And then we also need the transverse traceless part of our anisotropic stress tensor on the right-hand side of our equation of motion. So we need um, an anisotropic stress tensor or the part of that tensor that satisfies these two conditions here. Um, and uh, in the following, I now want to uh, derive again or write down the, again the equation of motion in Fourier space uh, and also solve it in Fourier space. So it turns out to be convenient to yeah um, uh, convert or to perform it to transform everything into Fourier space. I want to do this also here for the anisotropic uh, stress tensor. Uh, and, and then I find this relation here uh, with, with some uh, Fourier modes, a polarization tensor, uh, and then these plane waves. And just as a 
uh, short comment. Uh, this really is supposed to be already the TT part, but I will drop the TT superscript in the following for the ease of notation. And then yesterday we have seen how we can obtain this transfers, trace this part by means of some uh, projection operator. So if you want to look it up again, um, this is in the slides that we uh, um, discussed yesterday. All right, so um, for the purpose of this calculation, I want to make the same assumptions as yesterday. I suppose that this source is statistically homogeneous, isotropic, obeys Gaussian statistics, and that there's no parity violation uh, in the process of producing gravitational waves. So there's no preferred polarization uh, plus or cross. All right, so under these assumptions, the entire statistical information about the source is contained again in the power spectrum of these Fourier modes, the Fourier modes of my anisotropic stress tensor. Um, I can calculate the power spectrum just by taking the expectation value uh, of, of two Fourier modes here. Uh, and we will see later on that it's convenient to uh, consider Fourier modes at two different times. Yeah, So up to now, when we talked about power spectra, we always had the same time coordinate here and here, such that the power spectrum on the right-hand side only depended on one time coordinate. But now uh, we do the same analysis for two different times, eta and zeta, such that the power spectrum here on the left, on the right hand side also depends on two times, eta and zeta. And this is why this object is called the unequal time correlator pi. All right. And pi contains now, as I said, the full statistic information that is necessary to compute the gravitational wave spectrum. So basically the full statistical information about the properties of these Fourier modes. Uh, and yeah, also just as a quick comment, this normalization factor here in front, is just a matter of convention and chosen for later convenience. So it's not, don't pay too much attention to this prefactor. Uh, the important statement here is that uh, this expectation value is given by this function here. And because of our assumptions about uh, homogeneity, isotropy and so on, um, yeah, this only depends on k, eta, and zeta. It does not depend on the direction of k because it's isotropic. It does not depend on uh, polarization because we uh, assume no parity violation. That's why also we have this Kronecker delta in front here and so on and so forth, okay. Um, and in the following I want to show now, you can go from this object to the spectrum of gravitational waves. And then in concrete applications, when you consider a certain type of gravitational wave signal, the exercise always is to precisely determine this quantity. And then you can plug it into uh, the formalism that I'm going to describe now uh, and calculate the explicit, or can, yeah, you can explicitly calculate the gravitational wave spectrum. Okay, but now let's have a look at the mode equations again. I, I mentioned I want to do this in Fourier space. That's why we performed this Fourier transformation here. I want to write down the mode equations in, in Fourier space. And I want to do this in a background where the scale factor goes like, yeah, uh, like a power law as a function of time. Uh, and here I write this power law in terms of this parameter W. W is the equation of state parameter of a perfect fluid. So a perfect fluid has an equation of state, pressure equals this W parameter times energy density rho. Okay, uh, for instance, for radiation, W would be a third and for matter W would be zero. Um, and I want to write down the equations of motion in terms of conformal time. So remember conformal time is defined by this infinitesimal uh, relation here, or just by this integral. So conformal time is given as the time integral over one over the scale factor. And if the scale factor obeys this power law in terms of time, then it will obey this power law in terms of conformal time. Okay, so now let's write down the equation of motion again. Um, you can see it here. Uh, this is the left-hand side of the equation of motion. And we have seen this yesterday already. So nothing has changed. That's the same as in the slides yesterday. This is the equation for our tensor perturbations for the gravitational waves in Fourier space as a function of conformal time. And I use this variable capital H, and we talked about this yesterday already. The capital H is just my, uh, the Fourier, mode of my tensor perturbation times one power of the scale factor. So this basically factors out um, the redshift behavior or the redshifting of my tensor perturbation and makes this equation of motion look a bit simpler. 
Okay, so you've seen this yesterday already, and you've also seen the right-hand side yesterday. So this is just, again, the source term on the right-hand side, given in terms of the Fourier modes of my uh, anisotropic stress tensor. The only thing that's new is the PC in the middle. Um, but what I do here is just to evaluate A double prime over A. So with this assumption about the behavior of the scale factor, A is a function of conformal time, I can just evaluate A double prime over A. And I see that in this case of this power law behavior, I get something that goes like one over conformal time squared. That's why I have one over conformal time squared here. All right. And then the coefficient C up here just depends on what's happening in the exponent. So uh, this is a function of my equation of state parameter W. So let's be uh, very explicit. Uh, I mean, this is it's trivial almost. Um, and just evaluate this for different types of equation of state. So doing radiation domination, uh, the perfect fluid that drives the expansion of the universe is radiation and the equation of state is, or the equation of state parameter is one third. Um, so in, in that case, um, uh, you can uh, see, see it here. Uh, my scale factor is just linear in conformal time, just proportional to eta. If I take the second derivative of eta, it just vanishes. So this piece here uh, drops in the equation of motion. I can also see it here. So if I just take my coefficient C, I plug in W equals one third, C goes to zero. So I just get rid of this term. Uh, and then in the final step, I can redefine my time variable. So here I use conformal time. Double prime means second derivative with respect to conformal time. And now it turns out to be um, convenient to introduce some variable x, which is just k times eta. Okay, so then um, the first term goes into this one here. Uh, and the second one, which is proportional to k squared, goes to this one here. Um, and then the right hand side is more or less the same up to some factors because I changed my uh, time variable. Okay, so this is the equation of state in radiation domination. And the method domination, the story is very similar. So now my equation of state parameter is zero. Uh, I can use my formula for CW, just plug in W equals zero. And I find um, this one over eta squared term or one over X squared term. And now the numerical coefficient up here is two. Um, apart from this, it's the same story. And again, this was written down with respect to this new coordinate X. Uh, and again, yeah, I, I can write down the source term on the right-hand side uh, accordingly. So now we know how these equations of motion, the mode equations for our tensor perturbations look like in the presence of a source doing radiation domination and doing method domination. And in both equations, 17 and 18 are inhomogeneous, linear, ordinary differential equations. And they're inhomogeneous because now we have a source term on the right-hand side. Uh, yesterday, we solved these equations of motion already with a zero on the right-hand side. So in this case, we found, uh, well, in the general case, we found some Bessel functions, and then we looked at the solutions, uh, the explicit solutions doing radiation domination and method domination. Uh, but now this inho these inhomogeneous differential equations, uh, they can be solved using Green's functions. Uh, and let me just remind you of uh, this strategy to solve inhomogeneous linear ordinary differential equations. So if my differential equation is of this form here, some differential operator acting on my function f that I want to determine uh, gives some, uh, some inhomogeneous part on the right-hand side, then I can use the method of Green's functions to solve this differential equation. I look at a similar equation, a similar differential equation where the right-hand side is replaced by Dirac delta function. And the solution of this differential equation is what I call the Green's function, G. Uh, and this, genes, uh, this Green's function is well specific to this differential operator and also depends on the boundary conditions that I impose when solving this differential equation. But as soon as I know the Green's function of my differential operator, I can find a solution for this differential equation just by convoluting the Green's function with the inhomogeneous part in my differential equation on the right-hand side. So this is a general strategy to solve differential equations of this type. Um, and we can do this now for the two differential equations I showed to you on the previous slide. 
During radiation domination, the differential operator is just this one here. So let's have a look again. You see it here in equation 17. It's the second derivative acting on my function and then just plus one times the function that I'm interested in. So this is my differential operator. And you can convince yourself that the Green's function for this differential operator is just this sine function. Uh, and now we just use this general formula here. We convolute the Green's function with the source term on the right-hand side, and we are done. Then we have the solution. Here it is. So this is the solution at early times when the gravitational wave source is active and it appears on the right-hand side of my equation of motion. Uh, you see this integral over my uh, time coordinate, which I call y here inside the integral. And you see the Green's function. And everything else is just the source term. I, I keep the terms that, are de that depend on y inside the integral, and I just pull out all the prefactors that are independent of my integration variable. Uh, the integral begins at some initial time when the source becomes active. And this solution is valid for all values of x that are smaller than some final value of x. So the final value of x is the time when the source becomes inactive, when it shuts off, all right? Uh, and up to this time, this is the full solution of my equation of motion. Now we can imagine that the source becomes inactive, that it shuts off at some time. Uh, and then this equation of motion just becomes a homogeneous equation of motion in, in a homogeneous differential equation. So I just have a zero here on the right-hand side. Uh, and we've seen the solution of that equation of motion, motion yesterday already. So now we just talk about the source-free equation of motion doing radiation domination. Uh, so at later times for x larger than this final value, uh, we just have the we just have a harmonic oscillator uh, with some constants of integration, uh, which I cannot specify if I just look at what, what's happening at late times. Uh, but now we know what's happening at early times, so we can fix these constants of integration by the boundary conditions, by uh, the solution that we obtained at earlier times. So now uh, we can determine the coefficients a and b just by matching these two solutions. Um, I introduced this x final when the source shuts off. And prior to x final, this is the valid solution. And after x final, this is the solution. So we just match the two solutions at the specific value at x final. All right. You see that uh, the solution at late times involves this cosine function and this sine function. And now we can play with this Green's function in here. So let me just take my Green's function. It's really just this sine of x minus y, but I write it like this combination of uh, uh, sine and cosine functions. So now we have a cosine here, just like in that solution. And we have a sine here, just like in the second piece of that solution. Uh, and now I can really match two the two solutions at x final. And the result is this one here, you see, it corresponds to these integrals, but evaluated x, x final. Um, and A, which multiplies the cosine in my solution at late times, now involves sine of minus y here inside the integral. And B, which multiplies sine in the solution at late times, contains cosine of y inside the integral. So again, uh, yes, yesterday, uh, if this is too fast, I, I would say it's not necessary to really follow all the individual steps uh, live uh, and in your head as, as we're going through this calculation. I would really recommend to just try to, um, yeah, uh, what, what I, how I describe these calculations and then try to follow the basic philosophy. So yeah, the philosophy really is to have two solutions, match them at some intermediate time and then determine these constants of integration. Um, all right, so this is basically, yeah, there, there we have it. There we have the full solution. Now we can take that solution at late times and just use the values of A and B that we just determined. The result is here in equation 23 and 24. Uh, and we can calculate what we expect to see at late times uh, in our observatories, in our gravitational wave experiments. So we want to calculate the characteristic strain, HC. This was one of the measures of the strength of gravitational waves that we introduced yesterday. And the characteristic strain is defined by the power spectrum of my Fourier modes of the tensor perturbations. All right. Uh, so I can just take my solution 
that we just derived and plug it explicitly in here. Um, and then I find everything that's written down here on the left-hand side. And that by definition of the characteristic strain gives me this expression here on the right-hand side. Yeah, so um, if, if you want to convince yourself where this comes from, uh, I invite you to have a look at the slides from yesterday. Just look at the definition of this characteristic strain, how it's related to this expectation value of the Fourier modes. And then you will see that if I evaluate this explicitly based on my solution, I will get this here on the left-hand side. All right, um, so I don't do the calculation explicitly now, but imagine that we now take our solution and we plug it in here, and then we find our characteristic strain. In the final step, I can relate my characteristic strain to the energy density spectrum of gravitational waves via this relation here. So I take my solution for HC and just plug it in here. And then after these steps, I mean, this maybe takes uh, half a page of calculations or up to, up to one page of calculation maybe. Um, I find this final expression for the gravitational wave spectrum. Um, and let's have a look at the structure. Um, I have lots of prefactors which come from these pre prefactors here in my functions A and B. But what's more important is that I also have two time integrals. So there's an integral over eta and another integral over zeta. And this just follows from the fact that this A factor contains a time integral and this factor as well. So there will be two time integrals in this object and there will be two time integrals in this object. Okay, so this explains these two time integrals. Then these uh, sine and cosine functions here, they combine in such a way that I find a cosine of yeah k times eta minus zeta inside the integral. And then finally, if I plug a and b in here and take the expectation value, I will find the expectation value of two Fourier modes of my anisotropic stress tensor. So let's go back to the beginning. This is what's written down here in equation 14. If I have the expectation value of two Fourier modes of my uh, anisotropic stress tensor, I will get this unequal time correlator on the right-hand side. And this is exactly what happens now. So the expectation value of two Fourier modes of my anisotropic, anisotropic stress tensor gives me this unequal time correlator here. And now we see why we had to work with two different times because there's one time variable coming from this integral, so one A factor here, and another time variable coming from this integral, which derives from this factor here, and then the same for the second piece, which depends on the functions B. All right, so the upshot of this little exercise is that the gravitational wave spectrum is proportional to the double time integral over the unequal time correlator of the source. Uh, this is the general result, and now I can go ahead uh, and in explicit applications, I can specify this thing here and calculate the gravitational wave spectrum. Um, this was the result for meta domination, sorry, for radiation domination, because I used this differential op operator and this Green's function. I don't want to go through this again for meta domination. Let me just flash this at you. So here for meta domination, I have a different differential operator a different Green's function looks a bit more complicated. I can also solve the equation of motion at late times. I can also do the matching at some time x final, uh, and I can use the solution to calculate omega gravitational wave. The structure is the same. Um, this kernel function here looks a bit more complicated just because the Green's function is a bit more complicated, but the structure is the same. We again have a double time integral over this unequal time correlator. All right, so this is everything I wanted to say about the hot Big Bang and the signal from a generic source. And now, well, I don't have much time anymore, but yeah, during the next 10 to 15 minutes, maybe, I still want to talk about uh, inflation. Um, inflation has been proposed as a solution to the problems of Big Bang cosmology, uh, in particular the horizon and the flatness problem. Um, if you're not very familiar with these problems of Big Bang cosmology, I would say we can talk about this during the break. Here, I just want to introduce inflation. Um, yeah, the concept of inflation and then study gravitational waves in the inflationary background. So inflation denotes a stage of accelerated expansion 
almost yeah exponentially fast expansion during which gravity acts as a repulsive force. Uh, so the idealized, idealized realization of inflation would be just a De Sitter universe with a constant uh, vacuum energy density or cosmological constant. Uh, and in this case, well, the Hubble rate is constant and the Hubble rate is A dot over A time derivative of the scale factor divided by A. So if I solve this for the scale factor, I find that in De Sitter space, my scale factor grows exponentially as a function of time where um, yeah, the Hubble rate appears up here. It also turns out that in this case, in the Sitter space, there will be an event horizon, uh, which is given by one over H, the Hubble rate. So everything beyond that event horizon will no longer affect uh, the future evolution of the uh, Hubble and the Hubble patch that I'm uh, located in. All right. Um, yeah, just a couple of uh, key properties of inflation. Um, uh, let me go through this uh, a bit faster because I, I guess uh, many in the audience will be familiar with this. So um, the key property of inflation is that the entire observable universe is initially contained in one causal connect causally connected patch. You can see this here in this little cartoon where I show how physical length scales grow as a function of the scale factor. Uh, during inflation, the Hubble radius is roughly constant. This is this... Uh, Cyan, a blue line here, uh, but physical length scales like the size of the observable universe, they just grow linearly as a function of the scale factor. And then at very early times during inflation, the observable universe will be within a Hubble horizon uh, and can be even as small as uh, a Planck domain. And then at these very early, unit, uh, at, at these very, very early times, uh, we see that the observable universe is within yeah, a causally connected patch and also within a, a Planck domain. Uh, and then it inflates and becomes as large as the observable universe uh, today. Uh, so it has been in causal contact very early on during the evolution of the universe. And that explains uh, why our universe appears to be so homogeneous and isotropic on the largest scales. Um, we have a finite event horizon. That just means that everything that is outside our observable universe at very early times will not affect its future evolution. Um, also, inhomogene inhomogeneities exit the Hubble radius uh, during inflation, so that within a Hubble volume, everything um, becomes more homogeneous during inflation. Um, the curvature parameter goes to zero during inflation, so flat spatial curvature is an attractive solution of inflation, and it explains why our universe appears to be uh, so flat to such a high degree of um, uh, precision. Uh, and also inflation dilutes unwanted primordial relics. This may be again a comment for the experts, such as uh, monopoles, things that you don't want to be around anymore during the stage of hot being, uh, during the hot Big Bang. So inflationary cosmology extends and provides the initial conditions for Big Bang uh, cosmology uh, and is now part of basically our standard model of cosmology. But here I just talked about everything at the homogeneous background level. And there's another exciting prediction about uh, inflation namely that it amplifies quantum fluctuations of the space-time metric and of the inflaton field. So um, the scalar perturbations inside the metric and also the perturbations of the inflaton field, they can lead to, or they lead to density perturbations during inflation that then turn into the temperature and isotropies of the CMB and eventually into the large scale structure of the universe. So that's very appealing because uh, inflation can tell us now why the universe appears to be so homogeneous and isotropic on the largest scales. But at the same time, it also explains the origin of structure, the large scale structure that we see in the universe. But for now, in this lecture, we're more interested in um, tensor perturbations. So the tensor perturbations contained in the metric, they will, they will also be amplified during inflation. And these Amplified tensor perturbations then will lead to an irreducible background of gravitational waves from inflation. Uh, and this is what I wanted to discuss now. And I think I will go a bit over time now. I will spend maybe 10 minutes on this. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, we can maybe shift the break a bit or we can make the second part of the lecture a bit shorter. But yeah, I still want to cover this because I think this is really uh, interesting and important. All right, so the starting point is the Einstein-Hilbert action for gravity. So you see it here on the left-hand side. Uh, R is just the Ricci scalar, and this is 
how gravity is described in Einstein's theory of general relativity. Uh, but now we're interested in the tensor perturbations uh, of the metric. So I perturb my metric and I'm interested in our transverse traceless tensor perturbations. So they are contained in here if I perturb the metric and to second order in the action, I find this expression here. So uh, where we have our h, i, j's uh, again. All right. Um, as before, I want to decompose this into Fourier modes. Uh, as we've seen this before, I can use the orthonormality relation for my polarization tenses. Uh, you can do this exercise yourself if you like, uh, but then you can rewrite this equation uh, for the action like this, where we now have a momentum integral inside the action instead of a momentum, uh, sorry, um, an integral over position space. All right. Um, so this already looks like, yeah, um, the action of some scalar fields. However, we see that these kinetic terms, the terms involving the time derivative are not canonically normalized. So now it turns, now it's um, helpful to introduce some new canonically normalized field variables. So I absorb this prefactor, the Planck scale and this numerical prefactor inside my H variable, also the scale factor. And if I do this, I get a new quantity or two new quantities, V, uh, V plus and V cross yeah, for both of the polarization states. And if I introduce this V variable, I can write the action like this, okay? So now all instances of the scale factor uh, are gone here and then they are absorbed in V uh, and also in this dispersion relation. So now we have a non-trivial dispersion relation, which is given as K squared minus A double prime over A. And we've seen this many times before already. So uh, the fact that we're talking about some inflationary background is now contained in this dispersion relation. But apart from this, just look at this action. And this action looks like the action of two real scalar fields, V plus and V cross, um, with this interesting dispersion relation in Minkowski space. Um, and as we want to talk about the amplification of quantum fluctuations, we can now promote these two fields, V plus and V cross, uh, to quantum fields. So we take each of the two fields uh, and write them down in second quantization as such a Fourier integral where we have some uh, annihilation operators and some creation operators. Now we can quantize this theory. Uh, we can just impose canonical commutation relations for the annihilation and uh, creation operators. Uh, we can do the same for the field itself and its canonically conjugate momentum. So instead of uh, these commutation relations, we can also use these commutation relations. So we just have field variable commuting with its canonically conjugate momentum. Uh, and these commutation relations are the same. They are equivalent if I impose this normalization condition on the Fourier modes. But as soon as this condition is satisfied, this set of commutation relations is really the same as this set of commutation relations. Okay, so now we have a quantum, uh, yeah, we have a quantum field theory for these quantized fields V plus and V minus. And we can just look at the equation of motion uh, in the Fourier space, the mode equations for these mode functions uh, V of K in the inflationary background. And it's not very surprising that this looks exactly the same as many of the equations of motion that we looked at uh, uh, so far already. So again, we have this non-trivial dispersion relation, K squared minus A double prime over A. Um, and in a sense, this V, variable is very similar to this capital H that we talked about a lot already. So you see V is the same as capital H. So it's A times little h up to this prefactor here. All right, so the equation of motion is really very similar. But now the crucial difference is that uh, we solve it in a different background. So I told you how A double prime over A looks doing radiation domination, how this looks like doing meta domination. But now we want to evaluate A double prime over A doing inflation, okay? And we want to consider slow roll inflation. Doing slow roll inflation, um, the Hubble parameter is almost constant. So if it's constant, we are in the limit of the sitter space. Uh, doing inflation, the Hubble rate slowly varies. And I want to assume that the Hubble rate uh, varies with a rate of variation gamma uh, that is again proportional to H itself. 
So let's assume that this rate of variation is some constant epsilon times the Hubble rate itself. Uh, epsilon is supposed to be a constant much smaller than one and also positive. This is just a fancy way of introducing the first slow row parameter of inflation. So if I take this relation here uh, in equation 42, I can just write it like this. So maybe this is a bit from, more familiar to uh, some of the some of you in the audience. Um, so epsilon is just defined as minus h dot over h squared is the first slow row parameter with respect to the Hubble rate. So now I can take the definition of the Hubble rate. It's a dot over a, or if I express this in terms of conformal time, a prime over a squared. And I use this definition here and I write this as a function of the scale factor. So I don't wanna go through each of these individual steps here, but you can convince yourself that uh, epsilon based on this definition and this relation gives me that function of the scale factor. So I can rewrite this as an equation, a differential equation for the scale factor. So I just take that definition of epsilon and write it like this. So this is the same equation. Now it's a differential equation for the scale factor and I solve it. So this is the solution. And now we see how the scale factor depends on conformal time doing slow roll inflation. If I send epsilon to zero, so this goes to zero and this goes to zero, I just find this behavior here. A goes like minus one over eta times hover rate. This is the expectation or this is the result for the sitter space. Uh, but if I perturb the sitter space a bit, so if I make the hover rate vary by a bit, um, then this is the result for the scale factor. And now I take this result, equation 44, and I just calculate A double prime over A. Um, again, this is what appears here in the equation of motion. Uh, during radiation domination and method domination, this was this one over eta squared times some numerical factor. And something very similar happens here. So I take that solution, I compute the second time derivative. And for very small epsilon, I find this expression here. So uh, it's linear in epsilon for very small epsilon. Uh, and I can write this like um, in terms of some new parameter, new, which is three halves plus epsilon. And then I find uh, new squared minus a quarter. So during inflation, this is the new equation of motion I want to solve. And I have introduced uh, this new parameter here because now I can write down the solution of this equation of motion in terms of a special function, the Hunkel function. So uh, you can solve this equation of motion explicitly and exactly in terms of this Hunkel function. And now this new appears here as the index of the Hunkel function. Okay, so now we have solved the equation of motion during inflation and uh, we can discuss the properties of this solution. So we fixed some constants of integration already just by requiring that at very early times, um, deep inside the Hubble radius, uh, we obtain this solution here, just something that looks like a plane wave. This is the so-called Bunch-Davis vacuum. So we have imposed Bunch-Davis vacuum initial conditions. Uh, in that case, our mode equations, uh, sorry, our mode functions satisfy uh, the simple uh, harmonic oscillator equation. Uh, this is a positive energy um, solution. And we have made sure that this normalization condition here is satisfied. So this is the definition of the Bunch-Davis vacuum. And we have made sure that our constants of integration are consistent with a Bunch-Davis vacuum. Okay, so this is what happens inside the Hubble radius. Not very exciting. This just looks like very similar to a flat space result. But we can also evaluate the solution here uh, on super Hubble scales. And for this, uh, we just assume a very small value of k or k times eta. In this case, the wavelength is much larger than the Hubble radius as before. Uh, so I can look at the behavior of the Hunkel function for small values of this argument. Uh, and then you find well, some well, uh, messy prefactors that you should not pay much attention to. Uh, and then this piece here. All right. Uh, and again, in the De Sitter limit, I can just send epsilon to zero, or I can send this new to three halves. And then the exact solution in De Sitter space looks much simpler already. So you find this expression here. All right. Um, 
So we see that in the Sitter limit, it's it's very obvious, it's very apparent. In the Sitter limit, this V goes like the scale factor itself, which means that I should show this here. Uh, if V goes like the scale factor, the tensor mode itself, the tensor, um, the Fourier mode of the tensor perturbation is a constant. So we had the same statement before yesterday. Uh, this just means that um, after horizon exit, so in the limit of a very large wavelength, um, my H, my tensor perturbation becomes constant. It freezes out on super horizon scales. All right, so now I can take that solution here for my function V. I can take this expression for the scale factor and you combine, yeah, you combine equation 44 with equation 49 and that gives the full result now on super horizon scales, super Hubble scales for the tensor perturbation. Um, maybe this was a bit fast, but again, you just have to combine the previous equations, I think 44 and 49, uh, and then you get this expression here. And here I've also used the relation between H uh, and V. Uh, and you find this simple expression here in the De Sitter limit where epsilon goes to zero. It's just proportional to the Hubble rate. All right. Um, and yeah, as I argued before, um, this is now a constant on super Hubble scales, which means that as the wavelength grows, uh, maybe I should show this again here in this little figure. Yeah, so the wavelength grows. Uh, and as soon as it exits the Hubble radius, it becomes a constant. And then it's a constant all the way up uh, to here when it re-enters the Hubble horizon again at later times. This is true for all the different length scales. So if a wave, a gravitational wave with this uh, wavelength exits the Hubble horizon here, then it will be constant outside the Hubble radius and it enters back into the Hubble radius here and it will only begin to evolve again once it's back inside the Hubble radius. Okay. Um, so now we have the full solution for our Fourier modes and we can plug this back into basically our Fourier integral. So now we have um, an exact solution for our quantized tensor perturbations. Uh, you see it's the same structure with these annihilation and creation operators the polarization tensor, everything is uh, back in this expression here, but we now know the solution for the Fourier modes. Um, and we can now calculate the power spectrum uh, in the context of inflationary cosmology. This is uh, typically called uh, pH. And here in this quantum field theory for the tensor perturbations, uh, we perform a uh, quantum expectation. We calculate a quantum expectation value. This gives us pH, but if I identify this quantum expectation value with a classical ensemble average at later times, this pH is basically very much the same as the characteristic strain, which I can also calculate from such a um, expectation value of four modes. All right, so if I do this, then um, I get this exp explicit expression for the power spectrum. You can forget about all these uh, prefactors, which are close to one doing sl a slow roll inflation. Um, just look at this structure of, of the individual terms. So um, this H coming from the two factors here will give me an H squared. This M Planck coming from these two factors will give me an M Planck squared. And then this piece here uh, will also appear as a square or will be appeared in its squared form in the power spectrum. So this is now um, the final result. And maybe the calculation or the derivation was a bit complicated involving the Hunkel function and all of that. But the result again looks very um, simple. And I said that um, the power spectrum or the evolution of these Fourier modes is fixed at the time of horizon crossing. Uh, so this will no longer change for a mode K as soon as this condition here is satisfied. This is just um, basically the condition for horizon crossing uh, rewritten in, in this form. It implicitly defines the time um, during inflation when yeah, K is, or when A times H is as large as K. Um, so after that time, uh, the power spectrum is fixed. So I can basically just evaluate this at this time, then this factor here will drop. This will just be a one. And I can evaluate this uh, as a function of H at the time of horizon crossing. And then the full information on the power spectrum is contained here in this very simple factor. All right, uh, so yeah, I am a bit over time, 10 minutes over time, but I can wrap up within um, 
just a few minutes because now I want to talk about the observational consequences of this calculation. We can repeat the analysis for the scalar perturbations for the co-moving curvature power spectrum, um, which comes from scalar perturbations in the metric and scalar perturbations in the inflaton field. And this is the result you find. I mean, I don't want to repeat the calculation, but it looks very similar to the case of the tensor perturbations. The only difference is this prefactor here. So this is again, the tensor to scalar ratio. And in slow roll inflation, you find a very clear prediction for the tensor to scalar ratio. It's 16 times the slow roll parameter epsilon. All right, and now I want to compare two observations. We can parametrize both power spectra, the one for the scalar perturbations and the one for the tensor perturbations in terms of such a uh, power law. So with some amplitude and some power law index. Uh, and then we can compare to CMB observations and try to constrain these observables. Uh, the amplitude of the power, scalar power spectrum has been measured uh, in CMB observations and starting with the COBE satellite in the early 90s. So this is very small and related to the typical size of the temperature fluctuations in the CMB. Uh, we now have clear evidence that NS is smaller than one at many sigma. Uh, so we know that the scalar power spectrum is red. It's tilted uh, tower um, lower frequencies. Oops, uh, but we have no indication yet of tensor perturbations in the CMB. So this is also what we talked about yesterday. We have not measured this thing here on the right-hand side. We only have constraints uh, on the observables R and the tensor index. Uh, one way to find evidence uh, for these tensor perturbations would be B mode uh, polarization. But again, uh, this has, has not been found yet in the data. So the best we can do is to put constraints on these parameters. And here you see a plot from the Planck collaboration. R, the tensor to scalar ratio is on this axis and NT, the tensor index is on this axis. And just by looking at data from Planck itself, you find this blue, this blue one and two sigma constraints but then you can also add data from LIGO because if you take that inflationary gravitational wave spectrum and extrapolate it all the way to LIGO and Virgo scales, then you cannot live here because then LIGO and Virgo uh, would have seen already gravitational waves from inflation. So that excludes this part of parameter space and brings us down here to smaller values of the tensor index. And in any case, uh, you would require some non-standard physics to really have such a large value of the tensor index, because in standard slow roll inflation, um, the tensor index typically is very small. So we have seen this here on in our explicit calculation. The index is up here, so it's minus two times epsilon, and epsilon is the slow roll parameter, a very small number. Um, we have also found this relation here for the tensor to scalar ratio, r equals sixteen times epsilon. So now we see that the tensor index minus two epsilon is actually related to the tensor to scalar ratio in this way. So NT should be minus R over eight in standard single field slow roll inflation. And this is a consistency relation uh, for this type of inflation. Uh, and the experimental confirmation of this relation would provide very strong evidence for inflation. But still at the moment, we are very far away from uh, proving this experimentally. All right, um, so I just want to show this plot here. We can also look at constraints on NS versus R. Uh, this is what you can see here, the latest Planck constraints on NS versus R. And this is really a key plot for inflationary model building. This is where, um, yeah, all the interesting things go on. Uh, if you construct models of inflation and you want to compare it to data, you see the predictions of many different models of inflation compared to the Planck constraints. Some are disfavored already and some look very uh, favorable. So this down here, for instance, is Starobinsky inflation. Uh, we can talk about this during the break if you're more interested. Um, and it's important to note that uh, future CMB polarization experiments, trying to find B mode polarization, they will push down these constraints on R by a lot. So Lightbird, a Japanese experiment or proposed Japanese experiment will be sensitive to R down to values of 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus three. Um, and my very last slide uh, for, for this lecture here is this one here. Um, so I only talked about gravitational waves during inflation. Uh, 
But at some point they re-enter the horizon again and then they redshift inside the horizon. So the entire expansion of the universe uh, after inflation will leave an imprint on the gravitational wave spectrum from inflation. So this is what, what you can see here uh, in this plot. You uh, start with a scale invariant spectrum from inflation. So just for simplicity, I set the scalar, uh, the tensor index to zero, just a flat line. Uh, but then you see the effect of the expansion after inflation. So uh, when the gravitational waves are redshifted to the present epoch, uh, and you see that all the important events in the history of the early universe leave their imprint in this stochastic gravitational wave background signal. And this is just because uh, the way in which, for instance, changes in the relativistic numbers of degrees of freedom affect the um, expansion of the universe uh, at later times and the redshifting of these gravitational waves. So in principle, if you could measure all of this in experiments, which would be very uh, futuristic and maybe also unlikely, but if you could measure all of this, you would see an imprint of the electric crossover the QCD crossover, e, pl e plus, E minus annihilation, uh, and so on and so forth. So in principle, this signal acts as a logbook that encodes the entire expansion history of the early universe. Uh, and this already, I think, is a very remarkable fact. Okay, so let's uh, wrap up here. Uh, here are the take-home messages for this first lecture. I try to tell you that each part of the spectrum corresponds to a temperature interval in the early universe. I argued that gravitational waves are a form of dark radiation and you can constrain them based on BBN and CMB bounds on delta N effective. And we talked about this a bit. I showed the formal solution for the spectrum of gravitational waves from sub Hubble sources doing radiation domination and method domination. Uh, I explained that the information on the statistical properties of the source are contained in the unequal time correlator pi. I uh, mentioned that cosmic inflation leads to the amplification of scalar and tensor perturbations, quantum fluctuations. We found a nearly scale invariant spectrum of primordial tensor perturbations on super Hubble scales with a tilt con controlled by epsilon, our slow row parameter. Uh, and we found the consistency relation for inflationary gravitational waves in single field slow roll inflation. Uh, NT should be roughly minus R over eight, and if you could show this in experiments, this would be in observations, this would be a smoking gun of single field slow row inflation. And I briefly mentioned that the spectrum today after redshifting since inflation encodes the entire expansion history of the universe and thus acts as a logbook of the early universe. That's it. Uh, that's the end of this first lecture. Sorry about for going over time so much. Uh, I, I hope I will do better uh, during the next lecture. So thank you very much. Uh, and yeah, now we have time for questions and for a break. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Very nice lecture. Yeah, so I guess uh, there are a lot of questions, but uh, yeah, we <laughs> will resume our uh, lecture in, uh, in 10 minutes or so. So maybe uh, yeah, we, we can, some, I mean, some uh, questions, but uh, nonetheless. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> You, you showed you showed us a very interesting uh, gravity the spectrum of the gravity yes. waves from inflation even from scale free uh, mm -hmm. uh spectrum in the beginning you could uh, observe and the uh, I mean the observe the entire history of the universe right it's very interesting yes. yeah so that is yeah. the, the you know, you are in a wide range of frequencies. So, so which uh, detectors that you can mm. be sensitive, sensitive to? Yes. Um, yeah, the problem is that this spectrum here is already tightly constrained by the tensor to scalar ratio that you can constrain from the CMB. Mm -hmm. um, that really, I mean, that probes this part of the spectrum here at frequencies around 10 to the minus 17 Hertz. Okay. And if I impose the latest bound on the tensor, tensor, tensor to scalar ratio of roughly uh, 0.05 or something like this, then I, I really need to push this down to 10 to the minus 15 here at these frequencies or 10 to the minus 16 here at, at higher frequencies. Um, so yeah, you would need to compare this to the sensitivity curves, but these are really small values for omega gravitational wave here on this axis. Um, so 
none of the existing experiments or not even Lisa will be able to see this part of the spectrum if the input spectrum is really flat. Mm. One hope is that futuristic space-based interferometer such as BBO, the Big Bang Observer, uh, that BBO will be able to cut into the spectrum here around millihertz frequencies or maybe even a bit larger. Um, then you would have to reach down to 10 to the minus 16 uh, on this axis. Um, yes, this would be a possibility, but then you have to hope that there are no other sources that contaminate uh, your signal. Uh, if, if this is buried in a lot of other signals, maybe from phase transitions or something else, then it would be very challenging uh, to see this spectrum. Uh, but yeah, what I'm showing here is just the simplest case. Yeah, So I, I put a scale invariant gravitational wave spectrum in the beginning. Uh, this, I mean, just for simplicity, corresponds to a ten tensor index of zero. Uh, I mean, even doing, yeah, doing standard slow roll inflation, you can see it here. I mean, I didn't mention it, but uh, what's also important is this negative sign, which is a bit unfortunate. Yeah, so uh, epsilon is positive. Our tensor to scalar ratio is positive, maybe some small value, but positive. But then in single field slow roll inflation, the tensor index is negative. And negative means, again, a red spectrum, which means that it would the amplitude would even uh, decrease, would become smaller if I go to larger frequencies. So this this doesn't go into the right direction. Uh, but you can think about more um, yeah uh, more elaborate versions of inflation, or more maybe also more realistic versions of inflation, where you have new types of where you have, uh, where the inflaton field couples to new physics. For instance, if you couple the inflaton field to uh, gauge fields, um, you can significantly boost the production of tensor perturbations. And in such models, you can have a positive tensor index. So now NT can be positive, you can have a blue tilted spectrum. And in such non-minimal models, this entire spectrum could be tilted upwards so that it goes to larger amplitudes at uh, higher frequencies. And then you may have a chance to see it in future experiments. But then it becomes very model dependent. I mean, here, this is really just the simplest case of standard single field slow row inflation even with a tensor index of zero. Um, for illustration, because you see the effect of the expansion history, uh, but this is very challenging. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Um, I had just a question about this yes, figure. Um, I see that around the QCD phase transition, uh, that there looks a little structure, the bump mm -hmm. structure. Is that because of the it just a change in a G star S or yes, uh, yes absolutely. Freedom. Yes, I yes. Uh, I mean, this is this is really the time in the standard model. I actually have a plot. Yeah, sorry. I should also say that uh, for this lecture, I have a lot of backup material, so you can look at the PDF slides if you like. Um, to calculate this imprint here, you have to know what is called the transfer function. The transfer function describes the red shifting of the gravitational waves after inflation. And in the bonus material, I derive the transfer functions. You can look at the backup slides to see how you actually get the plot I just showed to you. Uh, and then here, this is the evolution of uh, G star and G star S. Mm -hmm. And you see you have, the, you have the biggest drop here um, mm -hmm. at temperatures around uh, a GeV, maybe 100 MeV. So at the time of the QCD phase transition, this is where they changed the most. And this mm -hmm. is exactly what you see here in the spectrum. Yep. This would be amazing. I mean, if you could see something like this in experiments, but um, yeah, it's, it's very challenging. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Yeah, and then we talked about neutrino free streaming yesterday also. Uh, somebody asked, okay, uh, do gravitational waves really propagate freely uh, through the universe? And I mentioned neutrino free streaming. Um, so this is basically um, active, or this, this has an effect on gravitational waves in between the time of E plus and minus annihilation and meta radiation equality. At that time, the neutrinos uh, exert an anisotropic stress on gravitational waves. Um, and that reduces the amplitude of gravitational waves by a bit. Yeah, so without neutrinos, this would be 30% higher. So just higher by a bit. Uh, but the amplitude is slightly decreased by this effect of neutrino free streaming. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, it's just a, just out of a, my curiosity, but uh, why this region is drawn by this kind of oscillating uh, 
lines. Mm-hmm, is, mm-hmm. There because, is there any uh, technical reason or it's just a way of drawing? No, no, no. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the tensor motor, the gravitational waves, they really do oscillate uh, in, mm-hmm. um, in, in, inside the Hubble radius as soon as, as soon as they get inside the Hubble radius. Um, so uh, they are frozen once they mm-hmm. exit the Hubble radius during inflation, mm-hmm. then they stay constant mm-hmm. all the time. I mean, yeah, I should show this plot here again in the very beginning. Oops. Okay, so I mean, this holds true for all the different modes I can consider during inflation. Um, they exit the Hubble radius at some point, then they're constant, they're frozen out here outside and they re-enter again. And once they re-enter again, they begin to oscillate uh, at their characteristic uh, frequency. Um, and I mean, for very high frequencies, let's see. You cannot really resolve this anymore. Um, so the gravitational waves will come from all directions and, and oscillate uh, very fast compared to the age of the universe. So, mm-hmm. well, then it doesn't make much sense anymore to, uh, to draw some oscillating white line here. But for the very <laughs> lowest frequencies, and you can see it here, there's a maximum here that goes down to zero. Uh, mm-hmm. and there's another maximum here. These are really gravitational waves, almost as big as the current Hubble radius. Uh, and they oscillate on the time scale of billions of years. Um, mm-hmm. And then for some of these frequencies, we're just uh, mm-hmm. in a phase where um, the gravitational wave goes through zero. And then for mm-hmm. slightly larger frequency, that gravitational wave is currently in its uh, maximal phase. And then for the other one, it's, it's uh, in mm-hmm. minimal phase and then so on. Yeah, so um, these gravitational waves are really oscillating inside the Hubble radius. Mm-hmm. I see. I see. I see. Yeah, it's a good um, is it because of the, uh, the dispersion relation? I mean, the omega yes. k uh, that you are drawing, uh, writing, will be getting smaller at later times? Um, well, I mean, this is the frequency f is just the um, the oscillation frequency. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. This, I yeah. See. I mean, it's, it's, it's waves like photons, like electromagnetic radiation, and it's oscillating at a frequency f. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I see. All right. Yeah. So, okay. um, yeah. Let's, yeah. Let's yeah. Another we question. Need to finish our lecture. So, people. <laughs> oh, it's time. So, maybe uh, let's make a short break. Maybe. Uh, if let's have a short break. Yes. 43. <laughs> what time do you want to start? Region. Um, Lecture of today is also a continuation of gravitational waves uh, for from strong first order uh, phase of transitions. So it will be a very interesting topic, and uh, I see some people uh, who are expert on phase, first order phase of transition, like a legal. Oh wow! Okay. Legal Bian, <laughs> my former. Okay, now you're raising the bar. I see. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, hopefully, there will be lively uh, discussion. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Okay. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Um, Okay, so now we finally turn to uh, a first very interesting source of gravitational waves in the early universe after inflation. And that's going to be strong first order phase transitions. Um, So I will give a very broad introduction to cosmological phase transitions and the way in which they can produce a gravitational wave uh, signal. So if we have lots of experts in the audience, then this might be a bit boring for the experts, but maybe also interesting uh, to them and everybody else, the students in in the audience. But let's see, yeah. So um, as always, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions at, at any point. And I can say now already that in this lecture, you will see much less equations and much more uh, images and figures. Uh, and I hope yeah, that will be interesting. Okay, let's get uh, started. Right, phase transitions. We're all familiar with uh, phase transitions uh, in our daily life. For instance, in the kitchen, when we boil water and uh, water transitions from a liquid phase to a gaseous phase. And something similar can also happen in the early universe when cosmological phase transitions uh, take place. So in general, a phase transition is just the change of the physical state of a system, its phase, as a result of changing external conditions, for instance, uh, temperature or pressure. And typically these changes in um, the phase structure of our system 
uh, these changes are described in terms of order parameters. So here in the kitchen, uh, we can describe this phase transition in terms of the density of water in a liquid gas transition. But then also in condensed matter physics, we can think about uh, phase transitions inside uh, a ferromagnet, uh, a ferromagnetic material going from a paramagnetic state to a ferromagnetic state. Uh, and that phase transition would be described by the magnetization of the signal. Now in cosmology, something very similar can happen, but here we talk about changes in the vacuum structure of the universe as it expands and cools down. All right, uh, and the order parameter is not the magnetization or the density of water uh, in the early universe, but we describe these processes in the language of quantum field theory, and the order parameters to describe these phase transitions are the expectation values of operators such as um, these down here. So a scalar field phi squared and the operator, the expectation value of that, or maybe also the expectation value of a fermion condensate such as uh, psi bar psi. Um, so the usual story is that uh, in these phase transitions, um, these order parameters are zero at high temperature, and then they transition to a non-zero value around some critical temperature Tc. Uh, and then this non-zero value of the order parameter has, it can have many interesting consequences. Uh, it can give masses to elementary particles or it can change their interaction behavior. All right, um, very often phase transitions are associated with a spontaneous breaking of some symmetry. So, um, well, this is maybe very basic, but I should remind, I want to remind you that spontaneous here just means that the symmetry is broken by the ground state and not by the laws of motion, not broken by the terms of the Lagrangian. So we can have spontaneous breaking uh, of symmetries in this sense. And this is also what happens here, for instance, in this uh, super cooled martini cocktail. So here we see how super cooled ice inside the bottle uh, transitions to ice crystals in our martini, uh, martini glass. Uh, and then in this new phase, after the phase transition, translation invariance is broken uh, in the ice crystal here, but this is only spontaneously broken. Um, and well, something similar can happen in the uh, universe. We know that the standard model, the standard model gauge interactions are described by such, uh, by, by this gauge symmetry here, SU3 color, color cross um, times SU2 isospin times uh, U1 hypercharge. Uh, and in many models of physics beyond the standard model, for instance, in grand unified theories, this gauge group is embedded in much larger gauge, gauge symmetry groups, uh, all the way up maybe to SO10. Um, and this leads to the following intriguing scenario. We can imagine how uh, such a very uh, large initial gauge group is successively broken during the evolution of the early universe in different steps, and then each step uh, corresponds to a phase transition. And depending on the properties of this phase transition, these steps of symmetry breaking then may lead to a signal in gravitational waves. All right, um, well, to have the right conditions for the production of a strong gravitational wave signal, we have to look at the properties of the phase transition. Um, and the first criterion to decide whether we will have a gravitational wave signal or not is the order of the phase transition. And we can see this here in this plot doing a first order gravitational wave, oh, sorry, doing a first order phase transition, there will be a barrier in the scalar potential at certain temperatures. And then there will be uh, a true vacuum separated by this barrier from the false vacuum. Uh, and in this case, the scalar field or order parameter can either jump over the barrier because of some uh, thermal excitation, or it can just tunnel through the barrier quantum mechanically. Um, and if that is the case, we speak of a first order phase transition where bubbles filled with a true vacuum down here appear in the ambient space. And then these bubbles expand uh, and begin to percolate until all of space is filled by the new true vacuum down here, the ground state, the, the global vacuum, the global minimum of the scalar potential. So they, these bubbles expand, they accelerate and they transfer energy uh, to the surrounding plasma and they collide. And these very violent processes during a first order phase transition can then lead to the production of gravitational waves. Uh, the same would not happen in the case of a second order phase transition. This is what you see here on the right hand side. In this case, there's no barrier uh, and the order parameter or scalar field just moves 
continuously from the position here at the origin, um, the false vacuum down to a new position in field space, the true vacuum uh, down here. In this case, there will be no, there will be no bubble nucleation uh, in the plasma. Uh, and and uh, these effects that can lead to the generation of gravitational waves simply do not take place. Okay, so now in the following, I want to focus on first order, strong first order phase transitions. And in this case, we actually have three different types of sources for gravitational waves. So first of all, uh, we can look at the collision of the vacuum bubbles themselves. Uh, they store energy in the form of gradient energy in the scalar field. And when the bubbles collide, that energy will be released um, and be converted into gravitational waves. So in the following, I want to denote this contribution by omega b, where b just stands for bubble collision. A second source are sound waves in the plasma. Um, these sound waves are uh, uh, created by the bubbles sweeping through the plasma if there is a sufficient interaction between the bubbles, the scalar field, uh, and the plasma. Okay, uh, and these sound waves just correspond to compression and rarefaction waves in the bark plasma. Uh, and they can also source gravitational waves. And I want to call the corresponding contribution omega s. And then finally, uh, the motion in the plasma can become vortical at some point, and then uh, magnetohydrodynamic turbulence can take place in the plasma. And that turbulence can also source gravitational waves. And I want to call the corresponding contribution omega t uh, with t for turbulence. All right. Um, and if you add these three contributions in gravitational waves, you can you obtain a typical spectrum for gravitational waves from a strong first order phase transition. And before we go into the details, just as, as a little teaser for what we're going to discuss during this lecture now, I want to show you an example spectrum now here on this slide. Um, so this is for a benchmark point for a specific extension of the standard model that has been discussed in the first report on gravitational waves from first order phase transitions by the LISA cosmology working group. So uh, this benchmark point is just taken from this paper here. Uh, and for this benchmark point, you then find the three individual contributions from bubble collisions, sound waves, uh, and turbulence, each described by specific, uh, specific power law dependence um, at low frequencies and high frequencies. Uh, I mean, this discussion is already a bit old, almost six years. And since then there have been many updates. So, um, with the most, uh, well, with the state of the art technology to describe phase transitions, you would not obtain the same results. But this is just for illustration to show to you how it looks like roughly and in principle. So we can expect to obtain these peaked gravitational wave spectra from strong first order phase transition that will always give us, um, yeah, a dominant signal at some frequency range that corresponds to to the temperature at which the phase transition takes place. But that's a detail that we'll also come to later during this lecture. All right. Um, before we yeah, talk about these details, I want to ask the question, in what type of models do we actually expect first order phase transitions? Uh, and what kind of physical scenarios do we need to assume that we can hope for um, the generation of such a, gen uh, such a gravitational wave signal. All right, so let's look at phase transitions in the standard model. Um, the standard model predicts two phase transitions if the universe uh, should have reached, should have ever reached these very high temperatures, um, right? So the uh, first prediction is that the electric weak phase transition takes place at temperatures around roughly 160 GeV. So we need to reheat two temperatures above that after inflation, and then the standard model predicts um, this phase transition. This is basically the cosmological realization of the Higgs mechanism. So the order parameter of the electric phase transition uh, would be the expectation value of H dagger H, where H is the standard model Higgs doublet containing the, the standard model Higgs boson. Uh, and yeah, so the electric phase transition is also associated uh, with a symmetry breaking process. As I said, it's just the realization of the Higgs mechanism. So during this phase transition, we break SU2 isospin times U1 hypercharge down to U1 electromagnetic. Um, to study the phase space uh, of or the phase diagram of this phase transition, it's um, necessary to perform numerical lattice uh, simulations. 
Um, and you see, well, a sketch of the phase diagram here on the left-hand side. So the order of the electric phase transition um, and the corresponding critical temperature as a function of the Higgs mass. And then if you perform numerical lattice simulations of the standard model, you find that this phase transition is really a true phase transition for Higgs mass below 70 GV or so, uh, which you can see here. So uh, if the Higgs were, or if it had a mass of 60 GeV uh, and the universe cooled down from 100 GeV to 80 GeV or something like this, then the electroweak phase transition in the standard model would have really been a first order phase transition. Here in between, the standard model predicts a second order phase transition. However, for the observed value of the Higgs mass, which is around 125 GeV, that's what we know from uh, the discovery at the LHC, we are not even in this plot anymore. So the Higgs mass is somewhere up here. Uh, and then in this case, we don't find a first order or a second order phase transition. In that case, um, the electroweak phase transition is actually a smooth crossover where none of the physical observers really varies discontinuously. So um, that's a pity in a sense, because yeah, if it's not a first order phase transition, we cannot hope for a strong gravitational wave signal from the electroweak phase transition, at least not in the standard model. Um, and another motivation for a first order electroweak phase transition would also be electroweak baryogenesis. So that refers to a scenario where you can create the baryon asymmetry or meta anti meta asymmetry in the early universe during the electroweak phase transition. Typically, such scenarios of baryogenesis require one to satisfy the three Sakharov conditions. So to create a baryon anti, sorry, uh, meta anti meta asymmetry, you need to violate baryon number, charge um, invariance, charge parity invariance, and you need to have a departure from thermal equilibrium. You require some out of equilibrium process. So if, if the electric phase transition uh, were of first order, then it would realize this out of equilibrium uh, condition and uh, might provide the possibility to generate the baryon asymmetry at that time. But unfortunately, none of this is possible in the standard model because the Higgs mass simply is too large. Um, it's an electric crossover, so there will be no single and gravitational waves and also no electric baryogenesis in this simplest scenario just based on the standard model. So yeah, not feasible in the standard model, but of course, people are very creative and you can extend the standard model and look at modifications of the electric phase transition. And then in many BSM models, where you have new degrees of freedom coupling to um, the standard model and the Higgs sector, uh, you can actually turn this into a first order phase transition. You can get a gravitational wave signal and you can also realize, or you can try to realize successful electric baryogenesis. So this is a strong motivation for people to play around with modifications of the electroweak phase transition. Okay, let's also have a brief look at the other phase transition predicted by the standard model, namely the QCD phase transition, uh, which happens at temperatures roughly affect a thousand smaller, so temperatures around 160 MeV, uh, if the reaching temperature of the universe is large enough. Um, and during that phase transition, the quark gluon plasma becomes confined in hadrons, and the other parameter is the quark condensate. So um, this product of two uh, quark fermion fields, psi bar psi. Uh, and if that obtains a non-vanishing value at the time of the QCD phase transition, it will also break a symmetry, namely the global chiral symmetry of QCD. Uh, and presumably uh, the QCD phase transition or QCD transition is again a smooth crossover. You can see it here in this sketch of the phase diagram. So we have baryon chemical potential on this axis and temperature on the other axis. And then at very small baryon chemical potential in the early universe, we just go through this dashed blue line here where the transition is a smooth crossover. But again, people are very creative and then can come up with uh, modifications and alterations of this transition. So uh, it might be that if you embed the QCD phase transition in a universe exhibiting large lepton asymmetries that you can turn this into a first order phase transition. And the lepton asymmetry in the different lepton flavors, the asymmetry in the different lepton flavors at the time of the QCD phase transition are observationally uh, not very well constrained. So that's a viable possibility. And if these large lepton asymmetries should exist, 
it might be that the QCD transition is actually your first order. But in the standard case, it's not. Yeah. So just following the standard assumptions, uh, you would also speak of a QCD crossover. All right. So from this perspective, we have to conclude that gravitational waves from a strong first order phase transition is something that points to physics beyond the standard model because it simply does not work here in the standard case of the standard model. So in this sense, if we if we should discover gravitational waves from a strong first order phase transition, this would be a complementary probe of new physics, complementary to all kinds of laboratory exper experiments that we can do on Earth. For instance, collider searches for, for new physics. All right. So after this brief introduction to cosmological phase transitions and the motivation for searching for such uh, for gravitational waves from such phase transitions, I now want to turn to a slightly more detailed description of these phase transitions and the gravitational wave signal. So this will be the next part uh, of this lecture. Uh, and then finally, if there's still some time, I will talk about uh, models and different ways of quantifying experimental, experimental sensitivities to gravitational waves in these models. All right. Um, so, I mean, this entire business of modeling gravitational waves from first order phase transitions is very complicated and in many cases, one has to rely on lattice, uh, numerical lattice simulations. So I cannot and don't want to present any detailed calculation of the gravitational wave spectrum. Instead, I just want to do some back of the envelope estimate. Okay, so let's start again with the equation of motion for our tensor perturbations. Uh, I think we can't count anymore how often we've seen this already. So this really is, again, the same equation of motion for our tensor perturbations of the space-time metric. Um, now written in terms of uh, cosmic time, T, uh, and uh, here in this case in position space. Okay, so this is not in momentum space. Um, we have the source term on the right-hand side, uh, and for a phase transition, uh, the anisotropic stress tensor has this form. Uh, we have seen this already during the previous lecture. So there's a term for the scalar field, the order parameter, um, and that contains that describes the gradient energy that can be contained in the scalar field, uh, which is then, for instance, contained in the expanding bubble walls during the phase transition. And there's the second piece, including the energy density and the pressure um, of the fluid, of the plasma. Gamma is just the Lorentz factor. Um, and then V is the velocity field of the plasma. All right. Um, and I promise a back of the envelope estimate, so let's do this now. Let's assume that this cosmological phase transition occurs on a time scale that is shorter than a Hubble time. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, if it uh, takes longer, then uh, it, it might be that this phase, phase transition does simply not complete because it's too slow and then uh, yeah, cannot compete with the expansion of the universe. Okay, so let's assume that the duration is smaller than one over h. Um, and then I just want to look at this equation of motion and focus on the very first term here and the source term on the right hand side. So very roughly, I mean, this is really a brutal estimate, but just very roughly, I can uh, write the second derivative as the tensor perturbation I generate during the phase transition over delta t squared. So the duration of the phase transition squared. And I can pull the delta t squared to the right hand side and multiply it with the source term. Okay, um, so if this is my estimate for the tensor perturbation I generate during the phase transition, I can also take the first derivative with respect to time, and then I get this estimate for h dot, the first derivative uh, with respect to time of my tensor perturbation. So very roughly, it should scale like this with the duration of the phase transition and the strength of the source on the right-hand side of the equation of motion. So now we can take our expression for the energy density in gravitational waves. Uh, we've seen this yesterday in the first lecture. Uh, we got this from the energy momentum tensor of gravitational waves, just the zero zero component of the uh, energy, uh, energy momentum tensor. And this involves these two factors of H dot. So now we just plug in our very rough estimate for H dot. And we find that the energy density here is proportional to the duration of the phase transition squared Hi, um, hi, Craig. hi, Craig. Yes. I'm sorry, I want to ask uh, how large would be this, uh, how large would be the ro robust uh, 
of this method, this estimation? This estimation? Um, yeah, we will see this. Uh, give me a couple of more minutes. <laughs> Uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, it's 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 a perfectly valid question. Uh, I mean, it looks very rough, but maybe it's a bit surprising that it actually works quite well. Yeah. So uh, here I'm just showing to you this back of the envelope estimate, and then I can show you the exact result, not exact result, but you, I can show you some expressions that you obtain when you fit to numerical simulations, or if you do things like the envelope approximation for bubble collisions. And uh, it's surprisingly accurate, yeah? I mean, the structure is really the same and you just have to adjust a couple of numerical factors. Yeah, so it's, I mean, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm showing this estimate because it actually does not do such a bad job. <laughs> yes, before going to the next, um, would you remind me in, in equation two? Yes. I suppose this pi is pi tt. Yes. But, um, this, E and P, are they independent from phi or do they include the contribution from phi? Um, this is a very good question. And I, it's an assumption that it is yes. a relatively fluid. So it does not depend on phi. Uh, you think so? It's independent of, is that so? <laughs> I think, but. Uh, from microphase uh, calculation, it should be. Yes. It should be some function of phi. But uh, for now, uh, all these, uh, all these uh, latent simulation uh, formulas for the uh, sound wave, uh, they consider it's uh, independent of this phi. Or only, only, uh, only point is that uh, uh, they may, uh, the phi, uh, the evolution of phi may affect the evolution of this fluid, and also the fluid evolution mm -hmm. would affect the phi through equation of motions. Mm -hmm. I don't remember is that so. Uh, yes, yeah. I mean, I think uh, one important microscopic ingredient in these calculations, and I'm not showing it here, is you also have to think about um, yeah the coupling between the scalar field and the plasma. Uh, basically, the question is what is the friction that the plasma exerts on the bubble walls. And then this really de determines the type of phase transition that you end up with. Uh, the question is, can these bubble walls really accelerate to the speed of light? This would be a runaway phase transition. I will mention this in a couple of uh, minutes. Uh, or is there a strong friction force from the plasma on the bubble walls? Okay, mm -hmm. and, and then you cannot reach this runaway behavior and the uh, speed of light. And then you will just end up with some terminal uh, velocity smaller than the speed of light. Uh, but yeah, so I think, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, so I think this is the honest answer. Um, I mean, eventually, if we talk about the parameters describing the phase transition, you obviously have to know a lot about the scalar field uh, because you want to know exactly what's happening in the time in the temperature dependent effective potential, and that determines the strength of the strength of the field, uh, the the strength of the phase transition. Um, so in this sense, you have to know scalar potential or the free energy density of the scalar field. Right. I'm, I'm not sure. I think in the, this term here, I, I have to look this up, but uh, I mean, we had some comment already from mm -hmm. the audience. Um, mm -hmm. It might be that this only applies to the energy and the pressure of the plasma, mm -hmm. but yeah, I'm not entirely sure. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Also, I mean, I think, okay. So for the purpose of this lecture, I will not need this later on. I mean, this is really just for illustration. I will not perform any explicit calculation based on this. Um, yeah. All right, so because, yeah, it's proportional to velocity, right? This V i is a, a fluid velocity, right? Yes, it's the fluid term, yes, yeah. So I guess, yeah. So naively, I think somebody also mentioned this in the audience already. Uh, this only applies to the to the fluid field, but uh, again, I don't I also don't want to say anything wrong. <laughs> So let, 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 let me maybe double check after the lecture. Um, all right, so yeah, uh, we are back to our back on the envelope estimate. So we have this expression for H dot, and we plug this here into the energy density of gravitational waves. Um, then we find this expression here. Uh, and, and now I, um, I multiply by H squared, the whole parameter squared, squared. Uh, so H squared appears here in the numerator, 
And also I divide by H squared, so it appears in the denominator and then H squared times M Planck squared just gives me the total energy density at the time of the phase transition up to a factor three, okay? So this is now my estimate for rho gravitational wave. Uh, and we can use this to come up with an estimate for the gravitational wave spectrum that we can expect to observe today. Uh, it's here, this very uh, compact form. Uh, so this is the energy density at the time of production. So I will have to multiply by some redshift factor F, which accounts for the change in G star and G star S, uh, and then also involves the radiation density, uh, radiation uh, energy density parameter today. This accounts for the redshift from the time of production to today, and this decreases the signal by yeah, roughly a factor 10 to the minus five. Then we have this piece here, H times delta T squared, okay? Uh, and because this is rho, uh, yeah, lowercase rho, uh, and then here we talk about omega, I still need to divide by uh, one over rho critical, um, the total energy density today, or actually I do it, I divide by rho total at the time of production, and then everything else is taken care of by this redshift factor here. So to go from rho to omega, I have another factor of the total energy density at the time of production. Uh, so I have this object here, the expectation value over rho total squared. And this appears here in this k squared. Uh, in other words, uh, k is just given as an estimate, or k is given as the energy density contained in the source relative to the total energy density at the time of production. And in this very brief estimate here, uh, our estimate for the energy density contained in the source uh, would be this expectation value of two times pi, uh, which appeared here on the right-hand side of the equation of motion. Uh, and then the structure of, of this very simple estimate, very similar to the more realistic estimates that I will show to you in a minute. Uh, let me first say that uh, this signal here becomes sufficiently strong if the product of H times delta T times K is larger than uh, 10 to the minus four. So um, if this is 10 to the minus four, I squared, I get 10 to the minus eight uh, times 10 to the minus five here. This is 10 to the minus 13. That is still within the reach of Lisa. If Lisa performs, um, yeah, if, if Lisa uh, searches for gravitational waves or stochastic gravitational waves for um, an extended period of time, a couple of years. All right, um, so this means that we need uh, a slow phase transition with a large K value uh, to, to really um, maximize this product here. So delta T is supposed to be large and K is supposed to be large. The larger, the better, and the stronger the gravitational wave signal. All right, um, so this was a very rough estimate of the strength or the amplitude of the gravitational wave spectrum. Now let's do a very rough estimate of the peak Frequency. I mean, you have seen this here in, where is it? <laughs> okay, uh, sorry, that takes too long. Uh, we, you've seen it here, there's this spectrum as a peak structure. And now I want to um, come up with an estimate of this peak frequency. Uh, so yeah, earlier today, we derived this uh, frequency temperature relation. Um, and now we think about, or we consider a phase transition during radiation domination. Uh, and then this is the expression we found. I mean, the expression I showed to you uh, well, there I just abbreviated everything this here by, by some uh, function g, but the structure is the same. So the frequency uh, is linearly related to the temperature at the time of the phase transition. Okay. Remember, we have this prefactor x here. So the prefactor x takes into account how large the typical wavelengths are at the time of production compared to the Hubble radius at the time of production. So let's try to estimate this x of k. So the typical physical time and length scales during the phase transition are as follows. Um, the typical physical wave number k over a will be given by 2 pi over um, the typical, typical duration of the phase transition, delta t. Uh, and then if, for instance, we are in the case of a runaway phase transition where the bubble walls move at the speed of light, uh, I will just put the speed of light down here, okay? Um, so this, in this way, I get from the typical time scale to a typical wave number. Uh, and 
if you remember how this X was defined, we have to basically relate the physical wave number to the Hubble rate at the time of production. So I just multiply by H and divide by H. And then the prefactor here is XK. Uh, it, it might also be that the bubble walls move at a speed slightly lower than the speed of light. Then I can just repeat this exercise. So I, then I estimate that the typical scale in the problem will be two pi over the typical duration times the wall velocity, which is not necessarily the same as the speed of light. And then I find a different estimate for my XK. So again, I multiply by H, I divide by H and the prefactor is XK. Okay, so yeah, uh, v, v wall is the velocity of the expanding bubble walls. Uh, and I take this estimate for XK and just plug it in here. And I also use some numbers. Um, so you see that the peak frequency will go like uh, one over the relevant velocity. So either it's one over speed of light or one over the wall velocity. Um, and it will go like one over H times delta T. This is the second factor here. Uh, and so these two first terms, one over V and one over H times delta T just come from this little x factor. Then this term is numerical. Uh, this is numerical. This is numerical. All of this leads to uh, 1.6 millihertz. All right. And then I'm still left with a dependence on G star and temperature. And if we use some typical values for the temperature, 100 GeV and maybe 100 relativistic degrees of freedom, uh, yeah, we, we, we find this number here. So in that case, a phase transition around the electric phase transition. Uh, modification of the electric phase transition gives a peak frequency in the millihertz range. And this is exactly where Lisa is sensitive to gravitational waves. Okay, so yeah, this is what I just said. Uh, Lisa will be sensitive to phase transitions around 100 uh, GeV. Uh, and if we look at uh, modifications of the QCD phase transition uh, that take place at maybe 100 MeV, this will give us peak frequencies in the nanohertz range. And that's something that pulsar timing array experiments would be sensitive to. Okay, so again, this was just a very brief, uh, yeah, just a very rough estimate. In reality, the situation might be much more complicated. In this case, one might have more than just uh, one peak. This was this was also something you would see in my little plot of the spectrum, where you have one peak from sound waves and another peak from turbulence, for instance. It might also be that the peak is not actually a very sharp peak. It might be more like a dome some domed peak that extends for a finite interval in, in frequency. Uh, all of this can happen, but then to obtain this more realistic shape of the spectrum, you also have to perform more complicated or more detailed calculations. And the state of the art really is to perform numerical letter simulations or to use some very sophisticated analytical models. And here I just want to mention uh, one example, which is the sound shell model of Mark Hindmarsh. Uh, if you should um, encounter this in the literature, uh, which also does a good job to um, describe the spectral shape of the spect uh, the spectral shape of gravitational waves, and that compares well to the results of numerical lattice simulations. All right, um, let me yeah let me make uh, a few more comments on this the shape of the spectrum away from the peak. So now we roughly know the height of the spectrum. It depends on the duration of the phase transition and the strength of the source. We know the height of the spectrum, we know the position of the peak, but what is actually the slope of the spectrum on one side of the peak and the slope on the other side? Uh, and then first of all, I want to make a very general comment. So recall that we derived this very general expression for the gravitational wave spectrum from a generic source that is active on subhorizon scales during radiation domination. We just, just did this before the break. So we have this double time integral over the unequal time correlator. Um, and now we look at very large scales, super horizon scales at the time of the phase transition. Uh, and in this case, we don't expect any correlation uh, in the source on these very large scales. So in this case, on super horizon scales, we would just say that the unequal time correlator pi should be a constant um, describing white noise. Okay, so on these scales, chi, uh, sorry, k times eta, much smaller than one, um, I will just have a constant pi here, and I can expand the cosine that gives me a one to first order, and then maybe some correction of order k squared. But if I neglect this correction of order k squared, I will just have a constant 
integrand here for these very small k values. All right. Uh, and then these time integrals are whatever they are. Yeah. But there's no k dependence anymore in here. So I can integrate over a cubed. I can integrate over this a cubed. This may give me some complicated expression or some numerical value, but it does not depend on k anymore. And the entire k dependence then comes from this prefactor here. So on these super horizon scales, the spectrum will scale like k to the third power. And I should emphasize that this is a very general statement. This does not only apply to gravitational waves from phase transitions. Uh, this is basically a consequence of causality that these sources uh, in the early universe, they cannot talk to each other on distances or, or cross distances uh, larger than um, the horizon scale. So causality tells us that for any such type of source, the gravitational wave signal will always fall off like f to the third power on scales that are larger than the horizon at the time of production. So very, for very small k values or very small f values, the spectrum will always be f to the third power. Um, but now we can look at what happens if we go a bit closer to the peak. Um, and here's some cartoons that show the rough shape of the spectrum from of gravitational waves from sound waves and from turbulence. And this f to the third or k to the third behavior is not even shown here anymore. This would show up here at even lower values on the x axis. Okay. Um, but then, yeah, we have different types of uh, power law behavior around the peak. Uh, in the case of sound waves, there are two characteristic scales that determine the shape of the spectrum. The first one is the mean bubble separation, R star, you can uh, see it here. Uh, so this is basically given by, um, yeah, depending on, on the wall velocity, but uh, speed of sound or the wall velocity times the typical duration of the phase transition. This is the size of the bubbles or their typical separation, and the separation of the centers of these bubbles um, after the phase transition, or I mean, shortly, I mean, at the time, <laughs> at the time uh, when they begin to percolate, all right? Uh, and that is a characteristic scale. Uh, and then what determines here basically a shape, uh, uh, a change in, in the power law behavior. This is very close to the peak in the gravitational wave spectrum from sound waves. Okay, but then there's another scale, uh, which is the sound, uh, which is the thickness of the sound shell. So the bubble walls, they um, uh, have a, a, a shell of the plasma, a sound shell in front of them, pushing them through the ambient plasma. Um, and then this can be roughly estimated like this, where you compare the wall velocity to the speed of sound in, in the plasma. Um, I mean, I can't go into the details here, but this is something that is described uh, more carefully in the sound shell model by Mark Hindmarsh. And that sets another scale here in the gravitational wave spectrum where the spectrum changes its slope, okay? Uh, but again, this, this comes also with uh, many uncertainties. This is basically the state of the art. You have to compare this to numerical simulations. Um, and it might well be that the details will still change in the future, uh, but just very roughly, uh, I wanted to mention that the spectrum is controlled by these different uh, length scales. And then for turbulence, the situation uh, is even uh, more uncertain. So here you see different uh, predictions for the shape of the spectrum, depending on different modeling assumptions. So you might either have this k to the uh, third power behavior here at low frequencies, uh, or even k squared. Um, and yeah, so there, there's still a lot of uncertainty in the description of this signal. Uh, and more progress is certainly required in the future. All right, um, so this is everything I wanted to say about the peak amplitude, the peak frequency, and the rough shape of the spectrum. Now let's talk about uh, different types of phase transitions. And then uh, these types of phase transitions can be classified according to uh, the velocity of the bubble walls uh, and the coupling between the scalar field and the plasma, all right? So the first case, maybe also a very simple case, would be a, phase, a runaway phase transition and vacuum. In this case, I only have a very weak coupling between the scalar field and the plasma, maybe no coupling at all. Uh, and then there's no friction acting on the bubble walls, and they can just accelerate, accelerate, accelerate until they reach the speed of light. And in this case, really the only source of gravitational waves comes from bubble collisions. Okay. The second case uh, would be that such a runaway phase transition takes place in plasma. So I uh, 
take into account the plasma, um, but again, the friction on the bubble wall is very low, very small, and they can accelerate all the way up to the speed of light. Um, but there will be some sound waves and turbulence in the plasma, so the gravitational waves receive uh, all three contributions from bubbles, sound waves, and turbulence. Uh, and then the final case would be that there really is a strong friction acting on the bubble walls, and the bubble walls reach some terminal velocity smaller than the speed of light. This would be a non-runaway phase transition plasma. In this case, the contribution from bubble collisions is negligible, and the most important contribution comes from sound waves and turbulence only. So um, to distinguish between these three cases, you have to know the bubble wall velocity. Uh, and this is act, yeah, determined by the friction acting on the wall. And this requires a microscopic computation uh, model by model. It's a model dependent question to some extent. I mean, you can also try to derive model independent um, expressions, but then in the end, if you really want to check the bubble wall velocity, you have to do this in your specific model. And I mean, I'm not an expert on these calculations, uh, but my impression simply is, or what I know is that there's still ongoing debate about this in the literature. And then very recently, especially also last year, people have proposed that um, the description of this friction term here requires some significant uh, corrections. And people still debate about what is the correct expression of this friction term. In particular, what is the scaling with the Lorentz factor gamma of the bubble walls? Is it a linear dependence? Is it gamma squared? Things like that. But um, yeah, so the upshot of this debate in the literature is now that the second case, of runaway phase transitions in plasma has become a bit more unlikely. So if you really have scalar bubble walls expanding in a plasma, uh, the friction will always be large, sufficiently large to prevent this runaway behavior. And in this case, uh, you would say, okay, this is unlikely and uh, you would more likely expect a non-runaway phase transition. All right, uh, but the first option, just a runaway phase transition in vacuum is also not excluded. Um, this is something that can actually happen in some models, or maybe even in many models, in the case of strong supercooling. So um, what does this mean? Um, the true vacuum that you want to end up in after the phase transition appears at some critical temperature, uh, Tc, but it might be that you are stuck in the false vacuum even after the critical temperature for a long time. So there's a delay until the bubbles finally nucleate at some temperature T nucleation. And if you are stuck in the false vacuum for a long time, then the plasma might be uh, diluted, strongly diluted uh, in between or during this temperature uh, interval here. And then when the bubbles finally nucleate, uh, they will just find themselves in um, yeah, strongly diluted plasma and they can almost freely expand and accelerate and really reach uh, that uh, runaway behavior and in a, a Velocity of the speed of, of, of the, uh, the velocity of the speed of light. Okay, so this has happened. This is possible in the case of uh, strong supercooling, uh, and in that case, really the most of the false vacuum energy is released into the field gradients and the bubble collisions. So then we have most of the gravitational waves coming from uh, the bubble collisions, and in this case, you can try to analytically determine the gravitational wave spectrum. Um, so here you see it. This is an estimate for omega. Uh, bubble collisions in the so-called envelope approximation. This is one way to do the calculation analytically. Um, and yeah, you find basically the same dependence as in our back of the envelope estimate. So there's this dependence on the effective number of degrees of freedom. There's the dependence on, dependence on H squared. And the only difference now is that I have introduced this beta parameter here. I mean, to make things a bit simpler, um, whoop these slides here, I was always talking about um, delta t. Delta t is the duration of the phase transition. But I now just give delta t a new name. I call delta t one over beta. All right. Uh, this is the standard terminology in the literature. Uh, and then, yeah, h times delta t goes to h over beta squared. So we had just found this also in our back of the envelope calculation. Um, then there's some dependence on the wall velocity. And then in this analytical calculation, you can also work out the spectral shape. Close to the peak, uh, you find this expression here. Um, I mean, from causality, you would expect that at even lower frequencies away from the peak, this power law index should go from 2.8 to 3. 
but close to the peak, apparently 2.8 is a better approximation. Um, and yeah, the corresponding peak frequency is this one here, which also shows the same dependence uh, as in our estimate on beta H and the temperature. All right. And in this case, in the case of a runaway phase transition where the velocity really goes to one, we only left with two parameters. So one is beta over H. It always appears in this combination, beta over H is the free parameter, and then just the temperature of the phase transition T star. So type number one, a runaway phase transition in vacuum uh, is a simple scenario just that just depends on two free parameters, beta over H and the temperature. Um, all right, so now let's turn to um, the way in which you can actually calculate these uh, quantities, how you can calculate, for instance, uh, the duration of the phase transition. Uh, beta over h. Um, and this is determined by um, the rate of bubble nucleation. That's something that you have to um, calculate based on the theory of vacuum decay in quantum field theory. So gamma is the rate of the bubble nucleations. Um, and it's either one of these two terms here. The first term describes uh, thermal fluctuations. So this rate is proportional to e to the power minus s3 over t. I will explain what S3 is in a second, but here you see that the temperature appears. So this corresponds to the rate of the thermal fluctuation over the potential barrier. And the second term describes quantum tunneling through the barrier. And this is uh, independent of temperature to some extent, yeah. Um, so these actions here, uh, sorry, these quantities S3 and S4, they are the Euclidean action of the scalar field configuration that describes uh, the bubbles nucleating in the false vacuum. All right. Um, and then for the description of the thermal fluctuation, I need a three-dimensional Euclidean action. And for the description of quantum tunneling, I need a four-dimensional Euclidean action. Um, and you have to evaluate these Euclidean actions at the so-called bounds solution. The bound solution uh, is the field profile, the profile of the scalar field across uh, the bubble wall. So um, typically, this is determined numerically. That's why I'm showing these plots here from uh, this paper, a find bounds, um, which is a numerical tool to find these bounds solution and to com compute these Euclidean actions here. Okay, um, so uh, the bound solution just describes the scalar field profile as you move from the false vacuum to the true vacuum. So here you see the scalar potential as a function of uh, the field, uh, and then the bound solution would be this one here on the right hand side, how you see from how you um, move from inside the bubble at some uh, small value of this radius, we call it rho here, uh, through the bubble into the false vacuum at a larger field value. This value here, phi of a bit less than minus two, would be this position here in field space. Uh, and then outside, the bubble you are here at zero, which is the position here in field space in the false vacuum. All right, so you determine this field profile. It's a solution to this equation of motion here. Um, uh, inside the bubble, you're in the true vacuum. Outside the bubble, you're in the false vacuum. Uh, and you plug the solution into equation 14. Then you have a value for the action. And you plug that number into equation 13. Then you have a number, a value for your uh, bubble nucleation rate. Okay, so how is this related to beta? Beta, I said, is the duration of the phase transition. So delta T equals one over beta. Um, and yeah, roughly beta is defined as the rate of variation of my bubble nucleation rate, yeah? So gamma dot over gamma. And then formally um, in this business, uh, in, I mean, in the literature on gravitational waves from phase transitions, uh, beta is basically defined as the the time derivative of the action, the Euclidean action that appears up here in the exponent uh, of the bubble nucleation rate. Uh, the philosophy behind this is that the prefactor um, only depends weakly on time, and most of the time dependence of gamma actually comes from the exponential factor. So you don't bother about the time derivative of the prefactor, you just look at the time derivative of the exponent of the exponential factor here. Okay. Um, and then, then beta is defined as the time derivative of S. This can be either S4 for the quantum tunneling, or it can be S3 over temperature for the thermal fluctuations. 
And then typically the time derivative is always rewritten as a temperature derivative, uh, which just gives you these extra prefactors here. And Tn is the temperature at the time of bubble nucleation. All right, so this is one of the relevant practices, like the physical, uh, the gravitational wave signal. Um, I argued why the duration of the phase transition is important. Uh, and then here in this formal description, this corresponds to this beta parameter of beta over H. And now we have seen how you can calculate beta over H in terms of the temperature derivative of this um, Euclidean action. Uh, if there's no strong supercooling, then the time of bubble nucleation will be very similar to the critical temperature of the phase transition and the time of bubble percolation. So then there's no big difference between these different uh, temperature scales. And I can just drop this ratio of Hubble parameters here. So then uh, beta over H star at the time when the bubbles collide and then produce gravitational waves would just be given by this simple expression here. I mean, maybe these are some technicalities, um, but yeah, you can look this up later if you like, uh, again, uh, because sometimes you see different expressions for beta over H, but in the end, um, this one here is maybe the most common one, the one that you see the most often in the literature. All right, so I said that strongly supercooled runaway phase transitions in vacuum are just described by two parameters, namely beta over H, the duration of the phase transition, uh, and the typical temperature scale. So now we can take our result from the envelope approximation and just compute um, the peak frequency, uh, sorry, the peak amplitude and the peak frequency and determine the sensitivity of difference. Uh, this is what I show here in this plot. So we have the peak amplitude on this axis and the peak frequency on this axis. This is a two-dimensional parameter space. We work with two input parameters, so I can basically draw contour lines for T star. These are the red dashed lines and contour lines for beta over H. These are these gray dashed lines. Okay, so uh, beta over H and T just cover this entire parameter space for different peak amplitudes and uh, peak frequencies. And now we can put the sensitivity curves of uh, future experiments in here. So Lisa, DeSigo, and in BBO. And this illustrates how these experiments will probe this two-dimensional parameter space. Uh, Lisa can go, go down to beta over H values around, um, yeah, let's see, uh, 10 to the four. Uh, so those are phase transitions that take place uh, within a a uh, fraction of the Hubble time at that uh, at the time, yeah, of uh, 10 to the four, uh, 10, uh, fraction 10 to the minus four times the Hubble time is the duration of the phase transition then, okay? Uh, and BBO and DeSire can go down go down to uh, even lower values of beta over H around 10 to the five or 10 to the six. So even faster uh, and yeah, uh, faster phase transitions that last uh, a shorter period. Uh, and I also show the prediction of different uh, particle physics models. I mean, I don't have time to go into the details here, but these are models discussed by the LISA Cosmology Working Group uh, in their review papers. There's a Dilaton model, which gives a very strong phase transition. So this can be clearly probed by LISA and the other experiments. Um, and another example where you have dark matter in a hidden strongly coupled sector, um, also discussed by the Lisa Cosmology Working Group that also gives a strong gravitational wave signal. So models of this type um, that lead to a super cooled runaway phase transition in vacuum uh, will clearly be probed by these uh, future space-based gravitational wave experiments. All right, um, so we talked about um, the first type of phase transition, runaway in vacuum. And now during the last 10 minutes, I want to talk about non-runaway phase transitions in plasma. Okay, so uh, in this contribution from sound waves and turbulence. And again, you can try to estimate the signal strength and you can uh, maybe adjust a couple of parameters if you compare to numerical uh, simulations. Um, so this is the general structure. You have some functions S for sound waves and some function S for turbulence that describe the spectral shape. Okay, so um, you just plug in the ratio of F over the peak frequency into these functions, and then you see the power law behavior on the left-hand side of the peak and the right-hand side of the peak. Uh, the peak frequencies themselves are also estimated in terms of our usual parameters, uh, beta over H and then temperature. Um, I mean, 
all I want to say is that now in the transition of, uh, sorry, in the description of these features, a few more parameters appear. So previously we talked about the wall velocity. In the case of a runaway phase transition, this just goes to one. Uh, we talked about the duration and the temperature, but now for this type of phase transition, uh, we also have a new parameter, uh, K kinetic, which appears here. This is the kinetic energy fraction, how much energy goes into um, sound waves or how much energy from the phase transition is transferred into the plasma. Um, and we have a new parameter in front here. This is T shock or tau shock, the time of shock formation. So you have to imagine that the sound waves are, are produced in the plasma, but at some point they will form a shock uh, and then these sound waves will become turbulent and then uh, turbulence sets in, in the plasma. And the time of shock formation is controlled by the typical uh, size of by the typical bubble separation, but also by the averaged fluid velocity um, U, which you can estimate in terms of the energy, the kinetic energy in the plasma. Okay, and then finally, here in this expression for turbulence, there's some parameter, some phenomenological parameter epsilon that describes the efficiency of energy transfer from um, sound waves to turbulent motion after shock formation. And as the this turbulence contribution is still poorly understood in the literature. People typically just put some yeah, phenomenological estimate in there. So in some extreme cases, people just put a one and say, okay, there will be as much energy in turbulence as in sound waves. But more often it's a smaller number, maybe 5%, 10% that characterizes how much uh, gravitational wave energy will result from turbulence in comparison to uh, sound waves. All right. Um, yeah, so there are different types of such phase transitions uh, in plasma. And then these can be characterized by the wall velocity compared to uh, the speed of sound in the plasma. So these types of phase transitions are known as uh, deflagrations, hybrid transitions, uh, and then detonations. So in the case of a deflagration, um, the plasma will be at rest inside the bubble and then the bubble will basically uh, push forward the plasma uh, around the bubble. Okay, so there will be some non-trivial velocity profile in the plasma outside the bubble. In the case of a detonation, it's vice versa. So uh, the plasma will be at rest in front of the bubble, but will be in motion and have some non-trivial velocity profile uh, behind the bubble. And in the case of hybrid transitions, uh, both is true. So there will be some non-trivial velocity of the plasma in front of the bubble and behind the bubble. Okay, so um, I mentioned to describe the sound wave signal, you need to know the amount of energy, the amount of kinetic energy that goes into uh, the plasma. Uh, and for this, yeah, you have to know the kinetic energy of the plasma. Uh, you can calculate this in terms of these velocity profiles and also enthalpy profiles across the bubble wall. Um, so this, just follows from the energy momentum tensor uh, for the plasma. The enthalpy is defined as energy density plus pressure, or can also be written as temperature. This here, partial derivative of pressure with respect to temperature. So you have to work out um, this object here, enthalpy or rho plus p across the bubble wall. And you have to work out the velocity profile. Um, and then if you perform this integral, you know the kinetic energy that is uh, that is transferred to the plasma, and you can um, yeah you do this for deflagrations, hybrid transitions, and detonations, and then you can determine the kinetic energy fraction, and this tells you the strength of gravitational waves from sound waves. Um, so yeah, maybe I can just jump over a couple of uh, details. Um, I mean, these equations for the velocity profile and the enthalpy, they are given in terms of hydro hydrodynamical equations that follow from the continuity equation in, um, in uh, of this system here. So I take the energy momentum tensor, um, the divergence is supposed to be zero. And from this, I can derive hydrodynamical equations for V and uh, omega. Uh, then you solve these equations, uh, you find the profile and you can calculate the uh, kinetic energy density. And then typically, and maybe this is the last thing I want to cover in this lecture before we can conclude, the usual strategy is to do this calculation, calculate the kinetic energy fraction in a toy model, 
uh, as a function of a couple of um, simple parameters. And then in a more realistic case, you want to match your realistic model onto the toy model and then use the results for the kinetic energy fraction that you obtained in the toy model. So yeah, this is maybe the last thing I want to cover before we can conclude. Um, so uh, Hi. Yeah, uh, sorry, typically, uh, I, yes. Sorry, uh, I, in your previous slide, uh, what is the CJ? Uh, what is the CJ? Uh, CJ, where? Ah, over here. Yeah. So uh, this is the Juguet velocity. Um, this is a special velocity that determines the boundary between this hybrid regime and the detonation uh, regime. I mean, it, it, it follows from these hydrodynamical equations. Uh, and then, yeah, you can basically look at these different cases for the wall velocity. If it's, you have to compare it to the speed of sound and the Juguet velocity to really determine um, which type of phase transition you end up in. Okay. Uh, and if the wall velocity becomes larger than the Juguet velocity, you will not have uh, a shock in front of the bubble wall. I mean, there's some explicit expression for this velocity. It depends on, um, uh, yeah, I have to look up uh, what it actually depends on, but it, it, it follows from these hydrodynamical equations here. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, this is not, not specific to um, these uh, cosmological phase transitions. Uh, I mean, I think the, the velocity has been already introduced in the 19th century, if I'm correct. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it, it is a general property that distinguishes between these types of um, yeah, hydrodynamical uh, motion um, and it really distinguishes between uh, deflagrations, detonations. I mean, here also the, um, what I call hybrid transition up here can also be described as a supersonic uh, deflagration. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I have some, um, I have some bubble, some, some, some plasma motion in front of the bubble wall. Okay. But at the same time, the wall velocity is larger than the speed of sound. Um, and this only works up to a certain limiting, va limiting value. If I pass this value, um, then I will no longer have any velocity profile here in front of the bubble wall and I will turn to a true detonation. Yeah. Um, I mean, but I, I have to look up the exact uh, expression for the GG velocity. I, I can also provide you with more references. So, I mean, I should say, yeah, it's, it's here actually. Um, so this figure here is taken from this review by Mark Hindmarsh. Uh, these are lecture notes by him on phase transitions and gravitational waves from phase transitions that appeared on the archive uh, just last year. The figure is also from this review. Uh, and if you want to know more details about this, uh, I mean, more details than I can tell you, uh, I really recommend to have a look at this uh, at these lecture notes by Mark Hindmarsh. Okay, so yeah, I, I just want to briefly describe how you can compute this kinetic energy fraction here in a toy model. And the toy model one typically uses is the so-called uh, Beck model. Um, this considers a sudden jump in the pressure and energy of a thermal plasma and a cosmological constant, a vacuum energy. So suppose that before the phase transition in the symmetric phase, I have um, a plasma component with this pressure and this energy density and some energy stored in the vacuum that gives me some constant contribution to the vacuum and to the energy density, epsilon, uh, and then some negative contribution to the pressure just because uh, yeah, it's supposed to be a form of dark energy or a form of cosmological constant. Uh, and then during the phase transition, this vacuum energy density is released into the plasma. And after the phase transition in the broken phase, I'm just left with uh, the plasma that now has um, this, uh, this energy density and that pressure. And these numerical factors here, A and yeah, A in the symmetric phase and A in the broken phase, uh, they can be different uh, because yeah, the number of degrees of freedom, uh, for instance, has changed during the phase transition. So this is a very simple toy model to describe what's happening during the phase transition. And in this very simple toy model, one can solve the hydrodynamical equations for the velocity and the enthalpy. Uh, and if you do that, then you can find the kinetic energy of the plasma in this toy model. All right. Um, so typically to match this onto other models, one has to 
uh, identify this epsilon parameter with something that you can also calculate in other models. So it here turns out that this epsilon actually corresponds to the change in the trace of the energy momentum tensor across the phase transition. So if you look at these definitions here in equation 24 and 25, you find that epsilon can be written like this. Uh, and then this is nothing but the change in the trace of the energy momentum tensor. Mm -hmm. So if I want to use these results from the back model for some more realistic model, I have to calculate this quantity here. Uh, and then I can identify this with epsilon and uh, use the results from this analysis. Okay, um, so now the kinetic energy fraction. Again, this thing here, the energy of the plasma compared to the total energy density in the symmetric phase can be written as follows. Um, so it's kinetic energy, again, in the numerator, nothing changed, nothing, nothing changed. Uh, but in the back model, now the total energy density in the symmetric phase is just this piece here. Okay, so I, I write it down in the uh, denominator. And then I can introduce a couple of new quantities. I can introduce, for instance, uh, kappa, some efficiency factor, that is basically um, the energy in kinetic, uh, the kinetic energy in the plasma divided by epsilon, my parameter in the back model. The, this is the vacuum energy density that gets released during the phase transition. And I call rho kinetic over epsilon. I call this kappa kinetic, which is a kind of efficiency factor. Uh, and then I can just divide all the terms here by this piece, the energy in the radiation. Uh, and this ratio is alpha. So this divided by a times to the t to the fourth power just gives me a one. Epsilon divided by this thing here gives me alpha, so it appears here. Here up in the numerator, I, um, I divide by epsilon. This gives me kappa kinetic. And then I have another epsilon that I divide by this thing here that gives me an alpha, okay? So if I start with this expression and I define alpha like this and kappa like this, I can write my kinetic energy fraction uh, like this here, okay? And now one can determine this kinetic, uh, this efficiency factor kappa, if I just solve the hydrodynamical equations in the back model. And, and then uh, kappa depends on alpha and on the wall velocity. So this is what is shown here in this paper from uh, 2010. Um, the different contours correspond to different values of alpha. So it's shown here, 0 0.01, 0 0.03, and so on. And the wall velocity uh, Vw or psi w is shown here on this axis. Uh, and then in this paper, they have worked out fit functions to this kappa efficiency parameters. And you see these fit functions to kappa everywhere in the literature. So everybody uses the fit functions to kappa from this plot to determine kappa and the kinetic energy fraction or to determine this kappa up here. Uh, you see this all over the place, basically. So um, yeah, numerical results plus fit functions. The efficiency factor depends on alpha and the wall velocity. Uh, and then you can go beyond this. I mean, this is what I recently did with a couple of uh, 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 where you look at variations in the speed of sound uh, close to the phase transition, then you can extend this analysis. But yeah, so this, this is a detail. If you're more interested, you can have a look at, uh, at these papers. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, this is how you determine the kinetic energy fraction uh, and calculate the signal from sound waves. There's one missing piece, namely this alpha. So what is the value of alpha? How do you know what alpha is in your model? Uh, let's have a look at this again. Uh, I just defined alpha here in the back model. It's the vacuum energy density released during the phase transition with respect to the energy and radiation. So let me write this down here again. Epsilon was the change in the trace of the energy momentum tensor. This is what we've seen here in equation 26. Um, so uh, in the most general terms, I can write alpha like this and then like this. And to go from this step to this step, I just use a couple of uh, thermodynamical identities in the bath at the time of the phase transition. So in a thermal bath with a constant temperature and constant volume and no chemical potentials, uh, these relations here hold true. So F is the free energy density, all right? Um, so I can write this change in the energy density 
and the pressure as a change in the free energy density. And this comes in handy because the Helmholtz free energy density F can be identified with a temperature dependent effective potential in thermal field theory, all right? So um, here I go from rho and P to little f, but then in a thermal field theory, I can replace or I can identify little f with a temperature dependent effective potential. And this temperature dependent effective potential includes um, the tree level potential, radiative corrections at zero temperature, but also radiative corrections at finite temperature. And then this well, can become pretty complicated the zero temperature correction, the radiative corrections at zero temperature are the Coleman-Weinberg potential. So you see it here. Uh, and the thermal corrections at non-zero temperature are given like this here in terms of some complicated integral uh, functions for bosons and fermions. Um, these all depend on my scalar field value, the order parameter of the phase transition. But here inside these expressions, I have field dependent masses. So whenever my scalar field phi gives mass to other degrees of freedom during the phase transition, uh, bosons, fermions, um, then I have to use these field dependent masses here when I evaluate these radiative corrections to my effective potential. And I have to take care of um, yeah, the different signs and uh, spin degrees of freedoms of those additional degrees of freedom that obtain a mass during the phase transition. So, um, uh, studying gravitational waves from a strong first order phase transition in a given particle physics model to some extent is really the art of computing this effective potential. I specify the model. Uh, I have to compute uh, all these corrections to the effective temperature dependent potential. Then I know this big object here, okay, including all the particle physics. Uh, and I can look at changes in this effective potential during the phase transition to compute my alpha parameter. Uh, and then this effective potential also enters the Euclidean action that I have to calculate when I want to determine the duration of the phase transition. And that gives me beta. So, but this is really the hard part and where all the work goes into if you consider a specific model, you want to know V effective very precisely and then the phase transition parameters. And yeah, I think this is basically the point where I want to stop in this lecture here. Let me just conclude with um, this flow chart of the analysis of gravitational waves from a first order phase transition. So you specify your particle physics model, um, then you compute the effective temperature dependent potential and you can calculate the phase transition parameters. You use the effective action to calculate the duration of the phase transition. Uh, you calculate um, alpha, the strength of the phase transition, how much um, vacuum energy density is released in comparison to the energy density of radiation. I can use um, that to compute kappa, the sufficiency factor, which you need to determine the signal from sound waves. Uh, in principle, you can also use your microscopic theory to determine the bubble wall velocity. And then once you know the temperature, beta, alpha, kappa, the velocity and all of that, you can plug this into um, these functions for the gravitational wave spectrum that you obtained or that you fitted to numerical simulations. And then you have omega gravitational wave, and you compare this to the sensitivity of experiments. For instance, uh, Lisa, uh, we had this equation yesterday. This was equation 16, I think, in my second lecture, uh, where you compare omega signal to omega noise. So here it's called omega gravitational wave, and you compare it to omega sensitivity, but that's really the same uh, what we discussed yesterday. And then you get the signal to noise ratio, uh, and you can try to uh, yeah, and then you can do parameter scans and then assign each set of models, uh, sorry, each set of parameter values in your model, a signal to noise ratio, and you can specify which part of parameter space of your model can be probed by gravitational wave experiments. All right, so yeah, my time is up. Uh, I still wanted to use the last couple of slides for some shameless self-promotion. Um, some sensitivity curves that I worked out last year, but uh, you can look at this later if you like in the PDF. So let me come to my conclusions. Uh, cosmological first order phase transitions appear in many BSM models, and they're typically associated with the breaking of a symmetry. Um, the symmetry can be from a modified version of the first, uh, yeah, can be from a modified first order electric phase transition. Um, we expect a peaked gravitational wave spectrum 
And the amplitude and the frequency are set by the typical time and length scales involved in the problem. Uh, there are different types of phase transitions, runaway phase transitions and non-runaway phase transitions. And these non-runaway phase transitions, they can be further classified into deflagrations, hybrids, and detonations. The relevant parameters to describe the phase transition are the wall velocity, the strength alpha, the duration beta over h star, and the temperature t. Alpha for effective potential. So this is where your particle physics model enters. Uh, and beta follows from the Euclidean bounds action, either for thermal fluctuations or quantum tunneling. Um, and yeah, so uh, because the spectral shape is fixed, you can construct special type special type of sensitivity curves. You can look at this later if you like. Um, and yes, so future space based rotational wave interferometers will probe a large range of uh, exciting scenarios. Um, that's it for today. Thank you very much for your attention. And now we still have a bit of time for questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your nice lecture. Uh, I think I still hear some howling. Yeah. Also, then it came back. Yeah, so okay, it's back. back. Um, it's yeah. back. So, come on, come. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah. Okay, uh, it's it was very nice talk. Uh, I missed the, your, uh, the most part of your uh, lecture due to my class actually, uh, but. Uh, Okay. Let me uh, ask this question. How much portion of the energy in the phase transition is released into the uh, gravitation waves? You know, for the binary black hole merger case, it's about 3%. Uh -huh. um, yes. I mean, it's, it's hard to state one. Uh, single value, but let's let's have a look at maybe, yeah. So the strength of the the strength of the phase transition is characterized by this parameter alpha, okay? And an alpha in the simplest approach is given by uh, the vacuum energy density released during the phase transition in comparison to the total energy density in radiation at the time of the phase transition. Um, and while people come up with models of very, very strong phase transitions where alpha is extremely large, uh, much larger than one, maybe 10, 100, or even much larger, okay? Uh, but these models need to be taken with a grain of salt uh, because most of what I said is really based on the comparison to numerical letter simulations. And in these numerical letter simulations, people usually only study, study um, Mm, yeah, comparatively weak phase transitions or mild phase transitions. So what you see in these numerical simulations or what they study in these numerical simulations would be phase transitions with an alpha value of 0.1 at most, I would say. Uh, and then you take the results of these simulations to um, construct these up, fit functions uh, for the gravitational wave spectrum, this one here for the sound waves, and this one here for turbulence. So in this regime where alpha is not too large, maybe 0.1, uh, you can really trust these expressions. But then what you see very often in the literature is that people use a very strong phase transition with a very large value of alpha and still use these expressions. Um, and that's an extrapolation. It's not quite clear uh, to what extent this is really correct uh, or not. Um, so, I mean, there's a large range of scenarios a large range of yeah. models. You can get all different types of phase transitions, but I think the weak phase transitions or the, the analysis of the weak phase transitions is a bit more reliable. And isn't there any, any other uh, source which might contaminate this phase transition, uh, the gravitational waves coming from the phase transition in these frequency boundaries? Um, of course, yeah. I mean, um, let's see. I. Let's go to a plot of the spectrum at the very beginning. Hmm. I, let me try to find this. <laughs> Where is it? Here. Okay. Uh, this is just one possibility. Hmm. I mean, um, 
obviously people in the LISA experiment with LISA being sensitive to millihertz uh, gravitational wave frequencies, they are very interested in this possibility. Okay. Uh, but then there are also lots of astrophysical uh, sources of gravitational waves in the same frequency range. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, mm -hmm. a foreground signal, for instance, from um, uh, white dwarf binaries in the Milky Way, mm -hmm. compact binaries. Um, and then all of this will lead to an astrophysical foreground uh, in this frequency range. So it will be very hard to dig out this cosmological signal from the data. And even if you should find a cosmological signal in the data, it's not clear that it must be a phase transition. I mean, in the end, if you can yeah. measure the shape of the spectrum very precisely, this would give you some indication that it's really a signal from a phase transition. But I mean, tomorrow we'll talk about completely different types of gravitational wave sources in the early universe, topological or cosmic defects that can also lead to gravitational waves, things like uh, cosmic strings, for instance. Uh, and a cosmic string signal could be much larger here in this frequency range. So this could be an could have an amplitude of say 10 to the minus 10 at LISA frequencies. Uh, and then you would only see that. Uh, and the phase transition signal would be completely buried in, in this <laughs> cosmological foreground or background in that sense. Yeah. You prefer seeing the cosmic uh, thing? <laughs> well, no, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, nature does what she wants, but um, yeah. Uh, I think. I mean, also, yeah. This is this is. I think where we are at right now in the literature. Uh, mm. Many people just study one type of signal at the same time, one source at the same time. Uh, and that's maybe not very realistic. So it could be that in this, I mean, think about the type of signals we can see in the electromagnetic spectrum. That's certainly not just one source. Why should we only see one source in the gravitational wave spectrum? And then we know that we will be sensitive to all these astrophysical signals anyway in future experiments. Um, and yeah, so if there should be a phase transition, it could also be that there were several phase transitions. You have an overlap of different signals. So, I mean, you can, play around with this and you can consider many possibilities. But at the moment, people mostly focus always at, on one signal at a time. Thank you. Okay. So here uh, you said that this spectrum, yeah, can I continue? Okay, it's, uh, it's from runaway solution, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this, so what I mean, this, this is not non non runaway case. Um, yeah, in the non runaway case, you would not have the contribution from the bubble collisions. Um, it was expected. Sorry, what's that? Okay, then. Yes, in the non runaway case, you would only have contributions from sound waves and turbulence. Okay, and I mean, so I, 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 I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried to say this. I mean, this is from this is a benchmark point from. Uh, almost six years ago already. Um, yes. And yes. since then, there has been an update or some controversy uh, about these different types of phase transitions. And I think, I mean, my impression is that now people uh, would tend to say that the friction on the bubble walls is stronger than previously believed. So it's actually not possible to reach this runaway behavior. And also in this mm -hmm. model, I mean, this is just a scalar signal extension. And for this benchmark point, uh, you yes. would have strong friction on the bubble walls. Um, they slowed, I mean, they reach a, a final velocity below the speed of light, and this suppresses the contribution from uh, bubble collisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just transform more energy into, and then you have a dominant contribution from sound waves. Okay. And turbulence. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, this is, okay, this, I should say, I mean, this plot is not really up to date. I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, with a bit more effort, one could also try to prepare yeah, actually, a more up-to-date version I mean, of this plot. Uh, so, even, even... So we have uh, some modal dependent parameters, alpha and beta, right? And yes. then depending on this, the peak and the height of peak and the the, uh, the position of peak can change a lot, no? Yes, yes, of course. Um, yeah, so my, maybe now during the discussion, uh, we have time to look at this plot. Um, so, Let's let's have a look at. Okay, yeah, it is. You have a lot of here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is this is these are these are new type of sensitivity curves. I mean, uh, you can mm -hmm. look at this paper here. So I 
I proposed these sensitivity curves last year. This is sort mm. of my uh, brainchild, if, if you want. Okay, anyway, um, so these are sensitivity curves, not in the plot of the gravitational wave spectrum, but what you do here is you take the sensitivities and you project it into this two-dimensional space where you have the peak amplitude on this axis and the peak mm -hmm. frequency on this axis. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you integrate over the entire spectrum, knowing the shape of the spectrum, and then each mm -hmm. uh, spectrum is just represented by one dot, one point in this plot, okay? Mm -hmm. And these new curves, they project the sensitivity in this 2D uh, parameter space. And now you can compare many, 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 many different models and benchmark points at the same time, all right? Um, and then you see, see the variation here. I mean, for, for many models, uh, first of all, the sensitivity is not sufficient. So this is for LISA um, and the signal will be too weak uh, for LISA. But of course you have a strong variation. You can have peak frequencies around a millihertz, but these can also be much, much higher up to a hertz or even 10 hertz down here. Mm -hmm. It's very model dependent, um, but I think well, a challenge is that at the moment, everybody uses the same fit functions for the shape. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, these expressions for the shape, they follow from numerical simulations and there are just so many numerical simulations on the market. I mean, people run uh, different toy models on the computer to determine the shape of these gravitational wave spectra. Um, so at the moment, it's not quite clear how you can distinguish between different models just based on the spectral shape. I mean, of course, some people go a bit beyond this and um, try to describe the spectrum or the shape of the spectrum more carefully. Um, but yeah, uh, in I think large parts of the literature, people just use the same fit functions for the shape of the spectrum. Um, and, and then based on that, it's very hard to distinguish between different models. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I spend- Hi, can I have a- can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Kupan. Uh, could you go back to slide, uh, slide 17? Yes. 19, uh, 18. Sorry. Okay, here we are, 17, yes. Uh, okay, thank you. So in equation 28, you have defined alpha. But in some papers, I have seen other definitions of alpha. Can we, the right hand side, we have the factor of t, not over four. Do you have any comments on that definition? <laughs> yes. Um, I have written many referee reports where I tell people that this is the correct expression. <laughs> I mean, it depends on what you want to match to. Uh, I mean, if you don't uh, think about the back model in the background as is basically the justification for this value of alpha. You can try to estimate it in any way you want. Um, I mean, I know there are different value, values of alpha. Uh, you can define alpha basically just as the change in rho, the energy density, uh, and you neglect this piece here. This is one definition. Uh, people have also used just the change in the pressure, so delta p in the nominator or this nominator here. A numerator over this denominator. Um, yes, but I mean, any other definition of alpha does a worse job if you compare it to the back model. I mean, if you, the underlying justification for this analysis really is the back model and in these efficiency parameters, yeah, that have been determined in this paper here 10 years ago, um, then you should really use the correct definition of alpha. I mean, what you can, cannot do is you cannot use uh, your kappa kappa kinetic from this paper and the fit function to kappa and then use a completely different definition of alpha this would not be consistent oh i see i see yeah so i think it's a slight it's a slight imprecision and many yeah i mean uh well you you would say that this entire business still suffers from large uncertainties anyway so maybe this is a subtlety that you don't need to pay much attention to <laughs> but i think this can induce significant changes i mean i can also tell you here in these papers, I mean, this is without me, but um, then I collaborated uh, with these people at DAISY in Hamburg. Um, in both papers, you can see a comparison of, uh, well, I mean, calculation of this kinetic energy fraction, uh, and then a comparison of the performance of different estimates or different ways of calculating alpha. Um, and 
Well, we propose something that also takes into account variations in the speed of sound. And then this really approximates the full numerical result for um, the kinetic energy fraction or this integral here very well. Um, I mean, this calculation from 10 years ago based on this expression here also approximates the full numerical result very well in the back model. But then if you use other definitions of alpha, it gets worse and worse and worse. And then you can see the comparison here in these two papers. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so I really recommend if you do the calculation yourself, uh, please include this term here. <laughs> and okay, I've also seen versions where you... Okay, where, yes, and I, I have also seen versions where you don't have this factor of four, so just the factor of T. I think this is also not correct. Um, I mean, if you write down some, if you write down something like this, it must have a justification. It must come from somewhere, uh, and then this expression is really motivated uh, by the back model, by the fact that um, it approximates the exact results in the back model pretty well. But as soon as you deviate from this, uh, you will get yeah deviations from the back model, and you can no longer use the sufficiency factor. See, now I understand. Thank you. Yeah, it's the entropy change, right? So not only normally you have a potential, you can think of change in the potential, and you are adding the entropy change. So this is the second mm -hmm. is entropy, right? Yes, yes, yeah, very good, very good. You, yeah, yeah, exactly. So normally, so as I see, I mean, the there formula, are some models maybe when some part of parameter space. Yeah. Sometimes you see this. I mean, sometimes you see the second term is very small. Mm. Uh, it's negligibly small. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's totally okay. You just keep the first term, but you have to check it. You have to check it first. Yeah. Okay. For yeah, I think the uh, you 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 talked about the find the bounds to get the numerical mm -hmm. solution for the bounds solution. So uh, you also yes. show the the, the gravity, uh, gravity wave spectrum depending on the uh, which uh, is the dominant source for gravity waves. I mean, it's the analytics uh, expression for the gravity waves. My question is, the, uh, is, it, uh, is there an, any numerical code available to compute the gravity wave spectrum for given model? And then, uh, oh, that's a very good question. Um, I think, I mean, my, okay, according to my knowledge, I think none of these codes is publicly available. I mean, there are many codes to calculate the bounce action. So find bounds is for instance a tool. I have used this myself. This is something you can, you can import this into Mathematica. Uh, but I think these lattice simulations that actually put out the gravitational wave spectrum, I think this is in the hands of the people who do these simulations. Uh, yeah, I think they have not released the code. Mm, I, see. Okay. Um, I think, yeah, maybe, maybe it was, a, uh, I guess would also be, would, would require quite some effort to make this, to get this code into a form such that you can publicly uh, release it because um, I mean these I, I guess these are very difficult and hard numerical simulations and I think it will not be easy to make this user friendly and uh, readily usable by other people so I think yeah uh, <laughs> at least I'm not aware of such a tool I mean if somebody knows somebody else knows such a code I remember some uh, some analytic uh, equation for uh, evolution of bubble world, like uh, in the thin apart. Yes. So is there any yes. a similar uh, analytic expression for the thin wall, a thick wall, or including the thickness of the wall included? You know, um, I mean, in order to estimate yeah, the, that, that, that's, the, the bubble wall velocity. Uh, the bubble wall. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I know there's 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 an analytical derivation of the Euclidean action uh, in the thin wall limit. I think there are also estimates in other limiting cases. Um, I don't know exactly which ones. Mm. Um, I think, yeah, if, if for instance, if you, I mean, you want to describe the barrier in the in the thermal potential, and I think if you can if you can approximate this by a triangle. If you just say, okay, in the scalar potential, there's a triangle that separates the 
false vacuum from the true vacuum. I think you can also work out some analytical estimates. So in some limiting cases, it's possible. But I mean, if you're interested in a really precise result, then you have to use your full effective temperature dependent potential. So you calculate, come on, where is it? Uh, equation 30, which can become very complicated. And then if you don't want to lose any precision, you don't fit this by a simple triangle. Or you just say, okay, it's a, it's a thin wall approximation or something like this. I mean, you want to keep the entire information on the effective temperature dependent potential, the full equation 30. Uh, and I think from this point on, it's only possible to do it numerically. But yeah, by now, I mean, there are a couple of tools to calculate the bounds action. A final one, and then, um, a very famous one is Cosmo transitions. Maybe somebody in the audience has used Cosmo transitions already. Cosmo transitions. Yes, Cosmo transitions. This is a bit older. Mm. Find something from um, last year or the year before, one or two years old. Mm. Um, right. There are also, yeah, at least three or four different tools by now. But yeah, unfortunately, I mean, there's only, this helps you to determine one parameter. Uh, if you use these numerical codes for the bounds action, it gives you, uh, come on, where is it? It gives you beta mm -hmm. and maybe also alpha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, I mean, you, you just determine the phase transition parameters. And the last step to the precise form of a gravitational wave spectrum, you either, either use these uh, fit functions here. I mean, yeah, they are motivated by analytical arguments and then some prefactors are determined by comparing this to numerical simulations. Uh, to go this last step, I mean, yeah, to really have a gravitational wave spectrum from first principles, you would have to wrote, you would have to write your own lattice a code, and I think there's no code that is publicly available right now. I mean, if somebody wrote such a code and made it available to everybody, <laughs> I think this would lead to I don't know hundreds and thousands of citations. <laughs> okay, so. Actually, uh, yeah, but it's hard. It's hard to do uh, this. Uh, it's, uh, I have another questions. Uh, so this, this uh, in the case of non runaway uh, case, non runaway bubble wall, uh, there is a large yes. friction on the bubble wall, and uh, that is yes. due to the interaction between the scalar field and the uh, background plasma standard model particles. So suppose that there is no interaction, mm -hmm. but uh, can you? Imagine that there's a still friction. Maybe because we don't know about dark sector, there might be friction in the dark sector. Uh, yes. Which might be okay. I mean, within, I don't know, the radiation energy density in the early mm -hmm. universe, like a dark radiation. Right. Uh, but uh, it might be compatible with the observations. Still, I mean, you, have, I mean, I don't know if you can distinguish between different models just from the gravitational waves. <laughs> um, yes, that's, that's a good question. Um, no, it's absolutely true what you say. I mean, if I talk about the friction from the plasma acting on the bubble wall, it doesn't care whether this friction comes from standard model degrees of freedom or some degrees of freedom in a dark sector. So if I have a phase transition in a dark sector, I can still have friction not coming from standard model particles, but just from dark sector particles. Uh, obviously, I mean, as you said yourself, you have to make sure that you satisfy all constraints, for instance, on the effective number of degrees of freedom. You don't want to have too much dark radiation, uh, but then this is possible. I mean, um, there are some differences if you look at phase transitions in the dark sector compared to, for instance, a modified version of the electric phase transition. It might be that the dark sector, for instance, lives at a completely different temperature. Yeah, so if it's really completely decoupled from the standard model, it might have its own temperature. Uh, and then, then this would shift or this, this would affect the analysis. And um, then you would see a gravitational wave signal maybe in places where you wouldn't expect it to be if this was in the visible sector. Um, there's, there's a, yeah, I can say kind of, uh, I mean, a very successful and famous paper on this by um, Joachim. Joachim Kopp uh, and other people from Mainz University. Mm -hmm. The title of the paper is a dark, cold 
and noisy. So these are the three words in the title, first three words in the title, dark, cold, and noisy. And then something about phase transitions in a dark sector. Um, this is from 2018. And if you're more interested, I recommend that you look it up. Uh, and then they discuss all the different things that change if you move the phase transition completely into the dark sector. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, so yeah, we have a good discussion until now, so, uh, but it's getting late. Uh, but, uh, yes. I think that we, this is very interesting topic. So uh, I don't know uh, if you have any question that uh, uh, you can ask now uh, before we close the session. Yeah, a brief question is, could you remind me uh, what's wrong with uh, small B beta over H? Um, so the, the meaning of beta over H? Yeah, I mean, the small, I mean, if it is a larger than, uh, smaller than one, if it is possible to have a... a ah, okay. H. No, yeah, smaller than one, I think this is not possible. Uh, uh, beta over H smaller than one just means that the phase transition would take longer than a Hubble time in the early universe. Uh, and, and then it cannot catch up with the expansion. Um, so then, uh, then maybe some bubbles will form, but they will never meet, they will not collide, and you will not be able to transform the false vacuum into the true vacuum. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to make sure that the phase transition always completes. Uh, so this means the bubbles nucleate, and even despite the expansion, they must have sufficient time to actually uh, reach each other, collide, so that the entire space is filled by the true vacuum. Mm -hmm. And if the phase transition is too slow, you will have one bubble over here and one bubble over here, but the universe keeps expanding in the meantime, the bubbles never meet, yeah. and the phase transition never completes. So in, in all these uh, realistic scenarios that you want to consider, uh, the phase transition has to be faster than Hubble time. So beta over H must be larger than one. So, so for example, in the formula 11 in this uh, slide, uh, yes. uh, originally there should be some kind of cutoff. Of, I mean, the, actually the smaller the beta is, the larger the signal. Yes. It, it, sh it shouldn't be. Uh, um, yes, but I mean, it's not a free parameter. I mean, you have to find a model where you actually have such small values of beta. Uh, I mean, you cannot just put beta by hand, but you have to compute um, the rate of bubble nucleation. So you have to calculate how fast, how often do the bubbles actually nucleate. Uh, and then if you know um, the action or, or gamma, um, then you take this time derivative at the time of uh, bubble nucleation and that tells you beta. So it's not a free parameter. It, it's fixed by the parameters of your particle physics model. Um, and I think and in many models, the problem is that beta actually turns out to be too large. Yeah. So you put in your model parameters, you do the calculation, and you find a very large beta. And you don't like this because this suppresses the strength of the signal. And if you have a model where you can get small values of beta, then you are happy and, and lucky and uh, then this turns into your favorite model. But yeah, it's not a free parameter. It, it, you have to calculate it. And then um, and in models where the phase transition actually completes, uh, you will not find values of beta over H smaller than one. OK, yeah, thank you. OK, so I think the, so today uh, we had the many discussions. So. Okay, we will have a more, two more lectures tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So yes. we need to save our energy yes. tomorrow and also quicker. <laughs> and we save, <laughs> need to save, need to save the energy. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Makai, for your nice lectures and the discussion from the audience. Okay. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you very much. So <laughs> okay, thank you. I, I will uh, upload the recorded video in YouTube. So. You can watch it and repeat it and then going back and forth to see it. As well. <laughs> yes. And then to tomorrow, uh, we'll talk about uh, cosmic defects, in particular cosmic strings. And then during the final lecture, I will talk about nanograph. And in that lecture, I will also not have that many equations. Yeah. So the last lecture will be mostly uh, figures and, um, and plots of 
uh, nanograph and possible explanations. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So yeah. thank you very much, and then see you tomorrow. Okay, thank you.